Hello, and welcome to Infineris 2021 Investor Day. My name is Amitha Pasi, Head of Investor Relations at Infinera. We're excited to host you today in what we hope will be an informative and insightful day with a great lineup of speakers. As you can see from the agenda, we're going to kick off the day with David Hurd, CEO of Infinera, who will speak to you about the market opportunities in front of us, as well as our strategic priorities, and why we believe this is an exciting time to be a differentiated vendor of optical technology. Following David, we will have Parthi Kandapan, CTO of Infinera. Parthi will cover some of the technical advantages of our ISIX embedded optical engine, as well as our unique differentiated capabilities in vertical integration. Parthi will also give you a glimpse into our roadmap beyond I6. Parthi will then pass over the baton to Dave Welch, co-founder and chief innovation officer of Infinera, who will cover our pluggable strategy, as well as the new multi-billion dollar market opportunity with our XR Optics technology. We'll then take a short break before coming back with Glenn Laxdale, our head of product management. Glenn will walk you through our open optical portfolio, as well as the much anticipated update on our I6 program. And then we'll finally conclude the formal part of our presentations today with Nancy Erba, our Chief Financial Officer, who will walk you through the financial roadmap to our target business model. Throughout the day, you'll also get to hear from some of our customers on Infinera's unique value proposition and the progress we're making with some of our next generation solutions. After the formal presentations, we will save some time for Q&A, but we are time constrained, so we're going to limit the live Q&A portion to just our sell side analysts. But for everyone else listening in, please feel free, feel free to submit your questions at any time during the day, and we'll try to either address them during the presentation or address them at a later time. As a reminder, this presentation contains forward-looking statements that are subject to risks and uncertainties as detailed in our safe harbor statement contained in today's presentation materials. Infinera assumes no obligation to, and does not currently intend to, update any such forward-looking statements. And with that, let's jump in. I'd like to invite David Hurd, our CEO of Infinera. David. Hello, my name is David Hurd, and I am the CEO of Infinera. And I'm very pleased to be with you here today. Outside of the normally quarterly earnings calls that we do, today I'm going to take a bit of a different approach. Talk to you about why I came to Infinera, the market opportunity in front of us, the strategic vision that the company has, our core competencies, our execution plans to get to our target business model. For those of you that are unfamiliar with the company, I thought I'd give you a bit of a glance at Infinera of who we are, what markets we serve, and who our customers are. We're in the optical networking space, about a $10 billion space. The company was founded in 2000 on the operational and, and technological principles that optical networks would be driven by the vertical integration that controls the bill of materials. Uh, just similar to computer processing, that the optical network is controlled by the vertical integration that makes the similar Moore's law effect of price performance uh, in the optical network. You can see our relative size. We have many patents that are driving this optical innovation. We have over a thousand customers around the world that we intend to grow. Uh, 3,000 very dedicated employees that are very customer focused and out there to really drive innovation that matters for our customers. And we're in over 45 countries around the world. So truly a global company. Who do we service? Uh, you know, why do we matter to our customers? Our customers uh, fall in three uh, traditional categories. Uh, communication service providers, so those are the typical Verizons and AT&Ts and Telefonicas of the world. That typically makes up 74% of the market spend that's out there today. Internet content providers, those are the typical Amazons and Facebooks and Apples that are out in the marketplace. They're typically 14% of the market. And then enterprises and governments that are also running a tremendous amount of traffic across their, their networks. That's about 12% of the market today. You can see we're very well positioned within those service providers. We're in nine out of the top 10 service providers. Typically, out of the top 50 service providers, they make up about 75% of the overall spend within that service provider category. We're within five of the top six uh, ICPs. Uh, we intend to change that to make that six of the uh, six of the six, 
And we've got global presence again in those 45 countries around the world. Why do our customers uh, buy from Infinera? Why do they engage with Infinera? Why do they believe we're thought leaders in the industry? Our ability to take that vertical integration and drive down capital cost to really get to the lowest cost per bit, more traffic on an existing fiber, to really accelerate the performance or that Moore's Law impact across the network is profoundly important to the environment they're operating in because we're all consuming traffic at an unbelievable pace. My kids, an, uh, an astounding pace, especially during COVID, but at 30, 35% uh, per year growth, they've got to be able to take that traffic in and service you, and they can't increase your bill every year by 35%. So they've got a big problem ahead of us. We hit their capital costs with that technology that matters. And from an operational cost perspective, we make technology that's easy to use. We make technology that's agile, that allows you to shift traffic with demand. And if there's something we learned over this period of COVID, it's how important that is for our clients. So again, hopefully that gave you a bit of color of who Infinera is for those of you new to the story. Uh, if you think about our conviction here at Infinera, I, I think it's a really good example to give you why did I come to Infinera? I've been in the communications industry for over 30 years. And when I look at the future that we face as a company, boy, we're in an unbelievable spot in terms of favorable market dynamics. And I'll walk you through just the, the compounding effect that those have on the opportunities that are in front of us. Not only is it good, to be swimming where the current, with the current going with you. But having a winning strategy is super important to be, to be very focused and again, to have the core competencies in terms of vertical integration and the technology to make that happen, profoundly important. And the last element, you have to execute. And in order to execute, you have to have a team that's very focused on execution and that's, that's showing you the milestones and delivering the milestones along the way towards this path. So I'm very excited. I've been here four years now. I'm more excited now than I was the first day I've joined because each and every one of these categories has improved. So let's hit the first. There's four key market drivers that we really look for. The first, I gave you a little bit of color with my children. Uh, talking about that the relentless demand for capacity continues. I'm talking to our customers around the globe on a daily basis and their ability to predict where traffic is going to come from and in what format it's going to be is, is profound. Uh, the increasing market for coherent helps them with that. So as they think about their network, they think about their network from long haul subsea routes underneath the water to super long haul routes interconnecting data centers around the planet, uh, to metro networks and trying to move traffic around in between the data center infrastructure and the CSP infrastructure that's out in the marketplace, as well as the new network edge. And with 3G moving to 4G and 4G moving to 5G and no doubt 6G moving out to the market with the video consumption that's out there, there's never been a bigger demand for coherent technology. Coherent optical technology allows them to deal with that unprecedented uh, uh, traffic growth as well as the unpredictable market growth by using performance and the power of this capacity to make things easier for them to deal with in an unplanned world. Uh, we see three big sub-dynamics in that market for coherent a huge push to 800 gig in those core networks and those subsea networks. We'll talk to you about that a lot today. I'm sure you're very interested in that. Uh, a move in the metro networks to 400 gig and the re-architecture that has to happen in the network, that's an insertion opportunity for us, as well as some profoundly new technology, some unbelievable technology uh, on the edge of the network. We see 100 gig I never thought I'd say that in 30 years, 100 gig on the edge of the network to be able to, to keep up with this demand for 5G, the tablet, the video growth, the mobile edge compute growth that's going out over our network. So again, huge dynamics, 
uh, market dynamics that are driving a need for coherent optical technology. And there aren't many of us left out here that specialize in this technology. It's nice to have a market with, uh, you know, maybe not as much uh, furied competition. And we've got a period now, and this doesn't often happen in one's career, where the number one player in the market, uh, who is Huawei, is, is not participating in many of the markets that you know, we were participating in for the last decade or so. And that gives us a, a wonderful opportunity when the 30%-ish market share player is, uh, has got to take a proverbial knee in the market. And so that gives us another market insertion opportunity, as well as an opportunity to be able to uh, gain share, grow our company, drive scale, and proliferate our technology. And then lastly, insertion uh, opportunities, especially with a lot of these uh, uh, consume, uh, these uh, communication service providers in the world, they take time. Uh, these back offices have been complicated over my 30-year history. A, a move to open, you see it happening with Open RAN, you've seen it happen in the cable industry, you're now seeing that happen in the optical industry with open line systems and compact modular systems, allows us to take what used to be a two, three, four-year technology introduction cycle and shrink that down into six months. And really important if you're a company like ours and part of your strategy that I'll talk about is gaining share. So four really key fundamental uh, market drivers that we're focused on here at Infinera that again, get me very excited. So that market opportunity, when you think about it, the overall market, this will, will confuse some, uh, has been growing at two to 3%. But yet those open categories that we focused our research and development on, and we focused our recent strategy over the last three years on, is a field of open optical networking solutions that are growing at three to four times that market. Big piece of our strategy is focusing on where the market's growing the most and ensuring we have the right technology to be able to meet that market demand. When you think about the uh, sub elements of that market, you can see that the overall market share in that compact module is just one example. That market's going to be roughly a three to three and a half billion mark dollar market by 2025 and grow at a CAGR of 16%, making up a big portion of that blue line down there. We believe that market's going to grow at three to four, uh, three to four times the average market. And we intend to take share in that period. And you'll see that in our target business model that I'm going to review. And then Nancy will take it from PowerPoint uh, to Excel. These coherent optical solutions you'll see are also growing and will be 85 to 90% of the overall optical solutions market. So if you're a specialist in that domain, that's good news. As well as when we look at what makes up the bill of materials for what we sell, as well as what powers the performance of our customers' networks, that bill of material in an embedded uh, solution, for example, for subsea or for long haul or for metro core, 60 to 70% of the solution is that vertical integration or think of that as that optical processor that we talked about. In a pluggable solution that we'll talk about in the metro and on the edge of the network is 40% of the network. Super important to be able to not only own that, to be able to source it yourself, especially in times like this, but as well as to be able to drive the performance of that and own all the critical elements that make that come together. It's also very effective for our business model, as you'll see by our increase in vertical integration as we go from 2021 to 2022 through 23 four and beyond. So great market opportunity, but how do you turn that into an effective strategy that you can execute? Well, you need a couple of key ingredients. You need some high, high growth segments. So hopefully you saw by the, the display of the open optical market that I just went through to the overall market. We're focusing on things that are three to four times the average growth in the market. And we're really well positioned to hit the timing, the meat of the market when those technologies really hit, whether it's 800 gig in the core, 400 gig in the metro, or 100 gig changing the landscape 
of the excess edge. We want to focus on our customers' largest cost items and performance items. You know, often when you talk to customers and when I talk to customers, the first question I say is, what are the biggest challenges I can help you with? And it's really that focus on the cost items in their network to drive more performance. Again, if I can get more bandwidth over existing infrastructure, whew, that's the best form of cost savings that I can get for them. Uh, you do that, again, by increasing processors uh, technology, right? Increasing the performance of what you do. We're in our fifth generation. We founded the company in 2000. Um, this is what we do for a living. We've our core competence has really come home to roost. We needed the scale as a company to be able to get out into those large uh, service providers and ICPs and enterprises around the globe and to get that customer count. Uh, to a thousand. Now we can take this technology and deliver it in scale to be able to gain share. And then we want to maximize these insertion opportunities. These four essential ingredients are present today and that's why I'm so excited about our path forward uh, as we march through the next few years. You got to execute to make that happen, but our, our strategy is taking those four ingredients, you know, executing with laser focus, no pun intended, uh, and driving market share gains and growth uh, as a result, which you're going to measure us on every day. And again, I'm sure that drives shareholder value. So from a company standpoint, 800 gig, we're going to talk a lot about today. Parthi, our CTO, and Glenn are going to talk about how we see that scaling, what percentage of our revenues we view that will be in the short term and in the long term. Uh, why we believe our performance in 800 gig is actually industry leading and why we have some knobs to be able to even tune it up a bit more. It's a good field to be in because there's few suppliers because this isn't easy. This vertical integration that we founded the company on, developing a photonically integrated circuit, it's, it's not easy to do. Um, and we're really taking our craft and now we've got it aimed at the right uh, portion of the market in that core 800 gig growth. In the metro, for the first time, we're able to not only use our platforms to be able to get out into those markets, our wonderful software, our services, and the platforms that we have to insert into a new market opportunity for 400 gig, but we also have plans and uh, developments underway to be able to own our own vertical integration in that domain. Not only do we think that'll drive great performance enhancements for our customer, but we think it'll have great margin impacts for our uh, company and for our shareholders. And then lastly, we've been investing over the last 18 months in another groundbreaking technology. Dave Welsh is gonna talk to you about uh, a technology called XR Optics that's point to multi-point optics that is a game changer. And as you know, I will tell you, I've worked with a lot of really smart technical people in my 30 year career. I've never worked with any that have founded two multi-billion dollar public optical companies. And this is the most excited Dave has been about a forward technology. So I can't wait for you to hear uh, from him, from the horse's mouth, on where this technology is going and how it will impact our customers and ultimately our shareholders. So with those market insertion opportunities, we're gonna gain share and drive scale. It's clear that I-6 uh, is rolling out right now, commercially available and scaling. Glenn will give you all of the gory details that you've been looking for over the last uh, earnings call or two in that domain. We'll talk more about the Huawei opportunity, how that can be, again, a billion or greater opportunity by uh, 2025, and how we plan to take our fair share of that, again, because there's very few coherent optical players positioned with the right architecture, the right vertical integration, and the right team to be able to execute. We expect, you know, we, we expect this new technology of XR Optics to open up new TAM, completely new TAM in the marketplace. The company, when it developed its first photonically integrated circuit, made what many said was impossible, not only probable, but actual. And we intend to do the same in point to multi-point optics. Every other uh, network has gone point to multi-point. So this is not a matter of if, it is a matter of when, and it will open up a one to $2 billion market opportunity. And while we do that, 
We've planted lots of seeds and lots of green shoots with lots of customers uh, around the planet. You'll hear about some nice design wins. You'll hear about initial POs. You'll hear about, again, some, you'll even hear from our customers and testimonials about new technologies that we've introduced in tier one service providers that top 50 around the world. We intend to increase our wallet share over this period of time to be able to gain and drive scale. Lastly, execution is key. It's what you hold us accountable for. It's what you hire us for as, uh, as shareholders and boards of directors. Uh, we'll talk to you about our target business model for uh, 2023 that Nancy and I are, and the rest of the team are absolutely committed to. I think you, you've seen a lot of progress over the last 24 months towards that target business model. And we feel very good about our investment strategy and our progress towards making sure that that's achieved in 2023. And then we put the next milestone up on the table. And with that, that'll improve our capital structure. So lastly, that target business model over that period, given all of the market dynamics I just gave you and all the opportunity, look, I expect the company to be driving eight to 12% growth, top line revenue growth over that period. That's much faster than the market growth, which says we'll be gaining, gaining share and driving scale. We expect that today we're roughly at about 40% vertical integration across our platforms, roughly plus or minus. We expect to take that to 60 and ultimately to 70% vertical integration. But in 2023, when this business model we expect to achieve will be eight to 12% top line, 60% vertical integration. We expect that margin accretion that you've been seeing over the last, uh, last year and a half to continue to get to the mid 40s. And that'll drop double digit operating income while we continue to invest in these game changing innovations that create new total addressable market for the company. So looking ahead, how does all of this fit? Kind of in PowerPoint, Nancy and I have talked to many of you uh, both in the uh, public earnings calls, as well as in our after calls, as well as investor meetings about this is a very foundational year for the company. We're introducing 800 gig technology. We're deploying lots of new line systems. Those are lots of seeds out there with those top 50 service providers to be able to grow. Over the last three quarters, near record line system deployment. There'll be a little bit of a margin challenge as we get into Q2 and Q3, or it'll, it'll provide a little bit of offset that we've talked about and built into our guidance. Uh, but we're continuing to drive deal structure and cost reduction to be able to offset that and drive new vertical integration with 800 gig introduction that's much more profitable for the company versus buying merchant optics. In 2022, as we plant those seeds, both in terms of line systems and new technology development, and that the Huawei bids for replacement that we're currently answering begin to show, show financial returns in terms of deployments out in the marketplace, you'll see those competitive displacements aggregate with you know, a, a very large portion of uh, new wins in 800 gig together with that re-architecture of the Metro driving a real growth year for the company in terms of growth and insertion. So 2022 is really about growth and insertion and then, and then, and then driving that vertical integ integration through the bottom line. So that 40% continues to move up as we get into 2023. Then you're gonna see vertical integration get taken to the next level with our intelligent pluggable of XR optics. It will decrease our overall uh, bill of material, our uh, cost basis for our Metro solutions, which will drive margin accretion in the business, which Nancy will talk through, and will continue to drive. 800 gig is gonna be a very, very long cycle. We feel very, very good about our existing performance and the performance knobs that Parthi and Glenn will talk about that we are uh, even gonna tune up as we go forward over time. So again, we then open up in XR Optics, a new TAM that again, will start to introduce new pluggables in the end of 2022, but really from a revenue standpoint, you can expect that beginning to make an impact in 2023, but really starting to scale as you get into 2024 and beyond, really changing the profile of our business model as a company. 
So it really is about us leveraging those uh, core competencies with a customer base that, that we're embracing and very attuned to what their needs are. It really is that the service provider uh, market and their architectures are very much kind of uh, coming together with the architectures of the internet content players. Uh, you're seeing a data center infrastructure, no longer a big monolithic switch uh, architecture. It's really being placed with a very nimble, uh, moving from uh, net ops to DevOps environment. And when that happens, the key processing capability that you have inside of those compact modular platforms is really what's going to drive the performance. Over the last three years, we've increased our investment in this category by 20% while we integrated a company and continue to drive costs down to the bottom line. So by concentrating on those optics, those DSPs, and the packaging of those together, which when you're getting to over 100 gigabaud in terms of performance, that's where the magic happens. That's how you're able to deliver the price and performance. Now, all of that sounds like wonderful technology, but for folks that are economically driven, if you're attacking 70% of the bill of material of an embedded subsea deployment, which you know, we've seen 150% growth in over our last quarter, and we see more growth ahead of us, or you're in the metro where it's 40% of the bill of material where we can replace merchant optics that we currently buy with a margin stack today of 45% on them with our own that we manufacture and make in our own fab that every time we double the capacity, the cost basis goes down. This is a model I really like. So you marry that foundational technology that again, optical processing technology with those economics and put them into platforms that again, allow us to deliver an agile, an agile and open service to our customers for easy insertion, no longer waiting three years, but again, able to insert in a few months. That allows us to be able to innovate and take share. And if you see, you know, we were innovators. We created the first compact modular platform in the Cloud Express. We've now created the compact modular platform that integrates both service provider needs as well as ICP needs in the same platform. It's great timing because those architectures are coming together. I love a strategy that leverages your core competence. So it is about execution. It is about execution. And you know, over the last two years, you've seen we went through an integration to drive the scale, to drive the customer mix that we needed to be able to deliver these new solutions. We, we tried to put together the, again, a, a very focused investment model that you're seeing now begin to pay off in both this vertical integration and these open optical categories. While we did that, we were driving, you know, 400 points of gross margin accretion and a thousand basis points of operating uh, income improvement. Pretty substantial from the team. We've improved our cash flow in that period by over $100 million, which was a big working capital improvement. More importantly, we doubled the size of our customer base and our reach. So these new technologies with less competitors, greater reach, better financial performance, pretty solid foundation. We did that while we increased our investments in i6, XR optics, our GX compact modular platform, as well as our entire open optical software suite and services. We increased that by 20% while we achieved this. We did this with a great team that you're gonna hear from today. So hopefully I covered for you why I believe, why I'm more excited today than the time I stepped into Infinera about the markets in front of us, the fact that we have a winning strategy, the fact that we are going back to our core competence, which is more relevant now than it was 20 years ago in terms of the success of our customers' networks and the benefits it provides to our shareholders. And lastly, I'm really proud of the global team to execute. It's a challenging market to execute in today with COVID uh, pandemic raging, uh, with uh, social unrest, uh, with what we're facing as a general supply chain today. Every day there's a new challenge this team faces and 
That's what we do. That's what you pay us to do. Another challenge comes ahead. It's another challenge this team has knocked down on a, on a global basis. So I'm really proud of the Infinera team. My thoughts and prayers are with the India team right now that we have uh, because they're facing a really tough challenge that we're rallying behind them uh, on. So I know it's all about execution. And I'm, I'm really pleased that the team that's executing is here in front of you. You hear from Nancy and I a lot. Uh, it's going to be really great for you to hear about the details of each of these categories uh, from the team members. Parthi will talk to you about those high capacity engines, the performance and where it's going. Dave Welsh, again, he's more excited than he's ever been. Uh, an industry icon that's come up with another winning hit in XR optics and opening up a billion dollar opportunity. Glenn will give you all of the details you need on wins, design wins, POs, backlog, and, and where we see i6 and 800 gig technology going. You've been asking for it. We need to deliver it. Glenn will deliver it. And then Nancy will wrap that all up in a nice Excel bow uh, to talk about our target business model and the milestones that you can expect from us uh, on an annualized basis as we go from now to our target business model in 2023. So with that, I'm gonna hand you over to Parthi. Thank you again for your support and we look forward to talking to you in the Q&A. Good day everyone, I'm Parthi Kandapan, the CTO of Infinera, and it's my pleasure to join you in sharing our optical engine technology and innovation roadmap. So let's dive right into it. Concurrent technology is what we want to talk to you today about. It's been, it was developed to drive capacities and reaches for long haul and subsea market. But today we see as we get into 5G and increased capacity in the axis and edge, concurrent technology is moving from its historic markets into the edge and uh, the cable access markets and so on. So 5G is a huge driver for this. One of the things that we see very clearly is that it's not a displacement of the long haul capacities into the edge, but it's the growth of the edge that's also taking up the long haul market. So we believe, based on all industry analysis, that by the year 2025, 85 to 90% of the total optical networks are going to be driven by coherent technologies. This is going to be a massively increased edge and access driven by coherent technology, but a simultaneous growth of the historic embedded market. And that is what makes us all quite excited. Now, why is it that we think this market is going to drive into the edge? Why is coherent technology with all its complexity going to drive? It's about the capacity. You are moving from cell towers that was quite happy with one gigabit of total capacity to individuals getting one gig data rates into their new phones or into their homes. And that ability to drive the huge capacity is made possible by taking coherent technology into the edge. Direct Detect will have a place in the network for very short reach cap capabilities and so on. So we see this total cost of the network being brought down by coherent technology for lower capacity but higher rates in the edge and higher capacity for a total fiber utilization in, in the long haul and so on. And this, this is going to be made possible by a combination of embedded technologies which drove the long haul capacity, total capacity, but pluggables are into the access and edge markets because of power and space considerations. One of the key things we want to bear in mind is that it's not a very defined pluggables at the edge and embedded at the, in the long haul. There's going to be some bleeding driven by pluggables used in low capacity long haul and high capacity metro making use of the embedded capabilities. So that combination, the total solution is going to be made possible by a combined coherent technology solutions that we drive at Infinera. I will talk to you about embedded technology. Dave Welch, our co-founder, will follow up with more details on all the innovation we are driving in pluggables. But remember, this is a seamless solution space that is going to be driven by common technologies. So let's look into embedded technologies a little more. Clearly, there is a dramatic increase 
in capacity, in capacity reach. And as we get to five gig, we are able to provide unheard of reach capacity to the market. But the associated complexity of making these technologies and bringing them to the market has essentially reduced the number of suppliers to effectively two players, Infinera being one of them, in the non-Chinese market. We believe that there are four capable suppliers who have the underlying capability, but today in the market, there are only two of us who are real players. And as we go to 800 gig, which is what is made possible in the fifth generation, we see a dramatic increase in the total market. Remember, this is not replacement of the embedded with pluggables, but a significant growth of the embedded along with the associated growth in the pluggables. And we believe that by the year 22, 23, 800 gig would be driving a total of $2 billion, and by 2025, $4 billion. The point being, a significant growth, a large market that is served by a very small number of capable players. That's a key point to bear in mind. So why is this performance? Why is this really important to us? As you look at the capabilities, we go from second generation to the fifth generation, the total capacity is gone up. That's made possible by spectral efficiency. So we've gone from 200 gig to 800 gig. But it's also important to realize that it's not about capacity alone. It's about how long that capacity can take, can take you. I call that the reach capacity matrix. Many of us make the mistake of looking at it and saying, oh, I can go 800 or I can go 400 gigs here or so on. But the real question you have to ask yourself is, how long can I take that 800? If the 800 can only go a couple of hundred kilometers, your total cost of ownership hasn't gone down. Similarly, if 400 gig can only go 400 kilometers, and in order to go to 1,500, 2,000 kilometers, you have to drop down to QPS gig, you've reduced the total reach capacity. So it's very important to not look at just the capacity and the spectral efficiency, but to look at a combination of reach and capacity. That combination is the true comparison. And that combination is what brings down the total ownership cost. So to give you an example, a lot of our customers, CSP so on, have essentially deployed third generation and earlier to drive 200 gig and 300 gig now so on. That is also associated with a total capacity of about 20 plus terabits so on. As they start deploying the fifth generation, their total capacity goes up 70%. When you go from 200 to 800, that's a significant capacity increase. Their fiber capacity almost doubles. As these fibers are very difficult to deploy, the total fiber plant is also complex, and that's one of the reasons for disaggregated. They want to utilize these fiber plants over multiple generations. Our open optical transponders in the fifth generation really make this possible. And that total reach capacity contribution brings down the total cost of ownership, and we are able to maintain, amid all the complexity, a consistent 30 to 40% total cost of ownership. So remember, it's the reach capacity matrix that's able to drive the total cost of ownership and essentially two players making that possible in today's market. So how is Infinera able to provide this market leadership? Uh, it's not purely about the technology, but leveraging the technology to really bring the products to marketplace. Now, typically when we talk about optical uh, innovation and optical transport, optical engines, we primarily look at two things. We look at the optical front end, what we used to call the ACO in olden days, and the DSP that made coherent technology possible. And we look at these two pieces. But it's not as simple as buying an ACO and buying a DSP and slapping them together. You get the best of breed in both, but the sum of the products is not as good. By owning a, both pieces and owning the vertical integration, Infinera is able to trade off the right optimal requirements on the optics and the DSP and bring together a technology integration. That's a critical piece we have to bear in mind. Why are we able to have a similar DSP and optics to our competitor, but essentially have two plus dB performance improvement over them at 800 gigabits? That's driven because what we call the total implementation penalty. And that penalty is driven significantly by our integration capabilities. That is the primary value we bring about having the total vertical integration. 
So if you look at this, this total vertical integration is made possible a slew of technical advances that we bring together that enables us to make the optimization across each piece of the total solution. And that results for Infidera, an industry-leading performance that we can provide, control of our destiny by having a significant say on the supply chain, and bringing a lower cost structure, which results in good margins for us. But at the same time, we are able to satisfy what matters to our customers. The highest capacity per fiber with a superior operational models because a less number of transponders, fewer regeneration sites, so on, brings the, not only that capex cost, but their opex cost and complexity lower. And we're able to do all of this at the lowest cost per bit per kilometer. Remember, the metric you have to look at it is not just lowest cost per bit, but cost per bit per kilometer. And that is made possible by the vertical integration, which we have driven for more than two decades. Now, if you look at the Optical Innovation Center, it's not centered at one side. It's actually a total capabilities of the company driven at three different sites, Sunnyvale, Pennsylvania, and Ottawa. There's an important point that I like to make in this world of geopolitics and supply chain uncertainty, so on, by having this distributed across the North American continent, but contained within North America, we are able to give our customers both a guarantee of supply chain, but also control over the supply chain uh, in uncertain times. And that's a very big distinction we bring over anybody else in this industry. Now, one question that we get asked is, okay, you're looking at embedded and you're looking at pluggables. Is that two different investments? Is that two different cycles, so on? The answer, simple answer is no. If you look at how XR was made possible, it was leveraging technologies we invented for the embedded subcarrier technologies that, was, that allowed us to make a very differentiating disruptive pluggables. A lot of the techniques we invent for the pluggables in terms of size and power reduction are fed back into our embedded to reduce the total size and power of our embedded so that we can increase the capacity while keeping the volumes lower. So it's a very virtuous cycle that allows us to leverage 80% of the technology that we reuse with common DSP techniques, with a common fab, with a common process flow, so on. And that's what we call leveraging a common platform, but packaging them into different configurations. And that results in a truly virtuous cycle where we can spread our total cost across multiple uh, segments of uh, the market, leverage a larger market to keep our fab fully occupied, and that brings both our cost structure down as well as the total cost of ownership to the customers. And it's truly a benefit that we see as we expand our market space. Now, all this is made possible, as I talked about the Infinera Innovation Center, the Optical Innovation Center. We have had a leadership in bringing new technologies to the market, a wide range of technologies. This is not a one-shot wonder, it's a continuous integration and we are able to build on top of each technology. Each generation is not about a brand new technology or innovation. We collect those and we leverage them. So we are on our second generation of subcarrier technologies. We've done gain sharing for quite a bit of time, so on. And all those results in technologies that have left our customer base absolutely delighted. You've seen press releases from Verizon and Windstream. We have run a large data center operator in North America, all of them have looked at us and said, you are really a generation ahead of anybody else in the high capacity market. And the last one we've done is a Facebook trial on Marea. We ran 100 gigabaud, running enormous capacity across more than 6,000 kilometers. So the sum result is we've taken an optical innovation center, we've taken generations of technology building on top of each other to delight our customers. And you don't have to listen to me. I would like to share with you a couple of testimonials from our customers who are actively engaged in deploying I6. I'd like to share the testimonials with you. Hi, my name is Andy Lumsden. I'm the Head of Engineering and Operations for Telstra International. 
Over the past 18 months, we have seen a surge in demand for connectivity globally, and the pandemic has an undeniable impact. Telstra is seeing traffic growth of approximately 35% as the world embraces a more digital way of living and working. To support our enterprise carrier and OTT customers, as well as to assist in their business expansions, a big focus for us is to continually invest in and enhance our network and cater to our customers' growing demand for connectivity. After evaluating the various options in the market, Infineera's i6 solution has been a good fit integrating with Telstra's existing international network and migrating from the current i4 solution. It enables us to meet the demands of rapid bandwidth growth by providing the greatest capacity with the greatest reach, resulting in a better yield, low cost per bit and high spectral efficiency. The solution offers flexibility for us to rapidly increase, move and retire transmission capacity as and when quiet. So we're midway through our validation of i6 with proof of concepts, uh, evaluating its performance on our network and all being well, uh, we'll start deployment in early in our early financial year. Hi everyone, this is Carlos Dassi, Telsio CTO. I hope everything stays safe and good on your side on this pandemic. With the global increase in demand for reliable, high capacity network connectivity, providing robust and diverse network solution is key for enterprise customers to be able to respond effectively to today's evolving digital requirements. As global network traffic continues to search upwards, driving by new technologies such as 5G and artificial intelligence and the increased reliance on cloud-based applications and connectivity, Telsius continues to expand and evolve its network infrastructure. A good example of this is, a, is that in the last few months, we have opened for business demand as part of our transatlantic proposition together with Marea. And on those days, we will put in open for business to Tanat on the Atlantic coast of Latin America. This year, we are also expecting to have the Mistral submarine cable ready for service. This is a project that runs along the Latin American Pacific coast, linking up Guatemala, Ecuador, Peru, and Chile, and offering the lowest latency between Guatemala and Chile. To be able to do all this, it's essential to have partners you can trust, in whom commitment is not an extra, and where passion for technology is part of their DNA. These are the main reasons why Telsius have been trusting Infinera for more than 15 years. The latest Infinera generation, IC6, based on 64 QIM modulation, has allowed us to obtain, in the test carried out on Brusa, about 20% more capacity moving from 20 terabits per fiber pair to 23.6. Based on this better performance and more spectral granularity, Telsius has made the decision to start deploying I6 on Brusa and very soon on our new cable in the Pacific, Mistral. As I said before, Telsius continues to expand and evolve its network infrastructure and Infinera and I6 will continue being part of it. Thank you very much for your attention and have a nice Infinera Investor Day. I know you're all interested in figuring out where are we in terms of our deployment of I6. Glenn Laxter, our SVP of PLM, who will be following, will talk to you in great detail about the initial ship shipments we have done and about our ramp that has got all of us excited. I will concentrate on talking to you about the technology and Glenn will fill you in on more of those details. Now, talking about the embedded roadmap itself, if you look at the bottom of this graph, I show you actual pictures of the five generations of PIC and DSP technologies that we put together. They are really to scale. The point being that from Gen 1 to Gen 5, you're roughly looking at the same footprint, roughly the same footprint. But in 15 years, we've gone from 100 gig technology to two channels of 800 gig, that's 1.6. So in 15 years, we have gone 15x capability in roughly the same footprint. That's what we promised two decades ago when we said we will bring 
the Moore's law technology capabilities into optics and we've delivered on those. And that's something we are very excited about and we believe we have the capability to extend that. You will see incremental additions on fifth generation where we, as I said, we talked about Maria demos, we've run 100 gigabot. We intend to bring that to the market very soon, following up after a ramp of I-6. And that will provide an additional cost and reach benefits to our customers. We are very excited about making that possible as a midlife kicker to our customers. And as I told you, we expect the 800 gig fifth generation market to have a long lifetime. And therefore, we intend to bring incremental capacity about it. The other point that we, we are very aware of is it's not enough to bring leadership to the market. We want to bring that earlier to the market. So one of the things we've done is even before we started shipping I-6, I we started investing in I-7. We've got many of the technologies already in progress. Our engineers are all ramping over to design I-7. There's a great excitement and energy in the company. We strongly believe that we will be able to maintain that greater than 30% total cost of ownership. And as I, as I told you before, technology is not about technology sake, it's about truly serving our customers. How do you get them greater capacities at a lower cost? We will leverage technologies, the appropriate technologies. Our goal at this point is to go greater than 140 gigabaud. We will use five nanometer, three nanometer as appropriate. We are not passionate about having a religion about technology, we will use the appropriate technology to get the best solution to the market and we want to bring it at the right time to market. So, I'd like to summarize by talking to you about the key takeaways. Embedded market is not being displaced by pluggable. Embedded market is growing symbiotically as the axis grows and edge grows. The backbone is also growing to serve all those edges. So it's a large market. We are serving a significant portion of that market and we essentially have only two players in the market. We clearly have an industry leading technology and as the testimonial showed you, we not only bring the reach capacity, we also bring an ease of use and our customers are delighted in using our technology. We have proven our leadership and we intend to keep that leadership in fifth generation by introducing 100 gigabaud and so on as midlife kickers. And our sixth generation is orderly underway. Our goal is to reduce the chip to ship time that it takes and bring the right product at the right time to delight our customers. Thank you for the opportunity. And I'll now like to hand over to Dave Walsh to talk to you about Pluggables. Have a nice day. Welcome. Thank you guys for uh, taking the time uh, to spend with Infinair today. Uh, we're, we're very excited uh, about some of our opportunities going forward. I also want to thank Parthi. Parthi did an excellent job of putting together uh, how we view the optical markets and why the, these embedded optical engines, which have been here for several decades, will continue to, to uh, move forward. What I want to talk about today is advancements in coherent pluggable uh, products, and Infinair's entree into that. And, and I have to uh, start the conversation by sharing with you a little bit of uh, my history. Uh, I've been in the business, uh, optical business, for 40 years. This is my 40th year, as a matter of fact. And, uh, and I have shared, uh, uh, watched and shared in the development of some major technological breakthroughs. Some of the first ones uh, worked with were with uh, low noise pump lasers for EDFAs and the transitions of the world from Sonnet into uh, EDFA based uh, DWDM systems. Been involved in the aspects of the development of rotoms. Uh, been involved in the aspects of development of photonic integrated circuits. Uh, over the last uh, actually decade now, been involved in the advancements of coherent technologies. The next generation of optical technology that we're gonna talk about here, I believe has greater impact uh, than most of those types of uh, optical transitions because it transforms optics from that of uh, just a transport but into a real um, functional thinking block within the optical network. And as a result, it makes dramatic changes to the efficiencies uh, to the economics, and uh, ultimately to the revenue streams that our uh, customers can participate in. So we'll get into that uh, as, we, as we go forward. Uh, and uh, I, um, I'm just extremely passionate 
about what uh, what's going on here today. And I, hopefully I can express that to you guys. Parthi talked about uh, this uh, um, uh, marketplace uh, from subsea and long haul and metro and how we're uh, the embedded engines there all will always be a high-end embedded engine because it drives the best uh, uh, net dollar per gigabit for the customer set out there but as that uh, coherent technology develops what we're finding is coherent in a pluggable format are starting to replace some of the pluggables that have been around for years that are uh, uh, non-coherent based technologies and so it's carving out the places of the market in the metro uh, types of uh, areas and if you look at the dollar opportunity for that the um, leading market uh, organizations have put together, uh, they've come up with uh, good sizes uh, for different opportunities, but they're really looking at the world uh, constrained to optics utilized in point-to-point -point applications. What I want to talk about and uh, augment that conversation is, is the use of optics in point-to-multipoint applications. Point to multipoint is a superset, and it includes that of point to point applications. Uh, and it's most obvious where point to multipoint applications play in the access network, but really they play throughout the entire network, inclusive of the data center uh, network. So we're going to spend some time talking about that point to multipoint and the impact that it has uh, throughout. Uh, these uh, pluggable metro uh, and access applications. So let's start with the thought process here. And this is, what are you trying to do with optics? Well, I, I'm trying to get information from its origin and I'm trying to move it to a place where I can in interrogate the bits in that data stream. If I look at my networks, and again, I'm going to uh, initially start talking about uh, access light networks. The application begs for the uh, movement of data from many locations and aggregating it into a, uh, a centralized location. This is done all day in uh, radio networks, whether it's an FM radio, whether it's a, a cellular tower, whether it's a Wi-Fi antenna. Point to multipoint is natural in their thought process. Optics, however, haven't been developed that way. Optics has been developed as a point-to-point -point technology, i.e. I put uh, information on one end of that fiber and I take it out of the other end of that fiber. As a matter of fact, I, if I put it in in the form of 10 gigabits, well, I have to have a 10 gigabit transceiver at the other end of that fiber. If I put it in at 25, well, I have to have a 25 at the other end and 100 to 100 and a 400 to 400. What Optics never has implemented at, for uh, networks with high capacity needs is the ability for low speed transceivers to talk to high speed transceivers. And because of that, Optics doesn't naturally fit a point to multipoint type of application. So the world of uh, telecommunications engineers said, okay, I've got Optics. They do point to point very well, but my problem is I need to do point to multipoint. So I'm going to start utilizing other elements uh, at my disposal, specifically electronic switches. Uh, and so I, I take this point to multipoint configuration where I've got high capacity at the hub, I got low capacity out at the edge uh, of my network. Uh, and so because the only tool I have is a point to point technology, I'm going to go from the edge. I'm going to get to, to a certain point where I feel I can aggregate those, those uh, sources, and then I'm going to transform all these low-speed interfaces electronically using TDM, or time division multiplexing, into one higher-speed interface, which I can then take to my hub location. Okay? So for every optical link, I need two transceivers. N optical links, I need two N transceivers. So I've got my 10 gigabit talks, my 10 gigabit, I transform that into 100 or 400 gigabit, and my 400 gigabit talks to my 400 gigabit at the other end. And I have to have an electronic multiplexing element based on time division multiplexing technologies in order to make that point to multipoint network work. If, however, I can make my optics, <coughs> excuse me, my optics think in uh, point to multipoint, which is like a cellular tower, I'm going to have a high bandwidth antenna and I'm going to go communicate to many low bandwidth antennas. Uh, uh, you know, I, I love the analogy uh, that uh, people have brought up where 
you know, uh, if you got a, a hundred cell phones and you're trying to all talk to the to the radio or the cellular tower together, uh, the cellular tower isn't made up of a hundred cell phones on its end. It's made up of a single radio unit, right? Well, in optics, that's what we need to transform to. And if I can create a high bandwidth antenna in optics that's capable of receiving from many low bandwidth antennas, optical antennas, uh, at the edge, well, then I don't need two N transceivers. I need N plus one transceivers. Uh, and that I've cut my transceiver count by 50%. And then I realize, hey, I no longer need that TDM device, which uh, integrated my uh, uh, bitstream, whether that was a, a layer one or an OTN switch, or whether it was a layer two uh, packet switch in that. I don't need that because I've actually done the aggregation in the optical realm, and I've done it using frequency division multiplexing instead of TDM. And the benefit is I don't need the um, uh, this intermediate box in here. I don't need the electronics for that, I need a very simple optical splitter, which is a passive, low, zero power uh, device that can sit anywhere out in my fiber plant. And now all of a sudden I truly have reduced the number of transceivers by 50% and have eliminated a, a significant piece of electronics in that system. Uh, and as a result, uh, the net is I can get, get as much as a 70% reduction in the capex and then in the opex of that system. Uh, just by transforming the optics so that the optics can talk low speed to high speed, point to multi-point uh, configuration, okay? So, <clears throat> excuse me, let's take a look at what that, what's that mean for a network. This is a, a, a particular network configuration of, of a customer and he's looking at a 5G uh, network. So you've got at the top of your uh, uh, antenna, I'm sorry, at the top of your cellular tower, you've got your radio unit. That takes the, the cellular signal and transforms it onto an optical uh, transceiver. That transceiver goes to the base of the tower, it'll either go through some optics, possibly some electronics down there, it'll go off into towards your central office, uh, go through a variety of uh, elements there, switches, leaf switches, spine switches, routers, etc. And eventually I go through a series of stages and eventually I get out to my regional data center. That signal from the radio unit had to go through 52 transceivers, uh, 19 switches and routers and eight transport boxes in order before it got to the regional data center. And all you were trying to do was take the information from that radio unit. You're gonna access the information two spots, one a local uh, area to interrogate the bits uh, and one at the regional data center. That's all I was trying to do, but it cost me 52 transceivers, 19 switches and routers, and eight transport boxes. That's because you built the network around the need for utilizing point-to-point -point optics. As soon as I start utilizing uh, optics, which can go where my low-speed interface can talk directly to my high-speed interface, well then I transform that uh, equation. And then I can dramatically reduce the amount of infrastructure necessary to perform my function. And my function, again, is just taking the information generated at the radio, bring it to a low latency or an edge data center where I can interrogate that information. And maybe in the future, I will have a significant amount of caching there or some compute or uh, cloud infrastructure at that edge location. And then I want to send the rest of the information on, on up to my regional data center. When I do that, utilizing point to multipoint optics that are sized right for the application, those 52 transceivers uh, reduce down to seven. Majority of those transceivers that go away are gray optics uh, in between my leaf and spine switches and my spine and my router uh, infrastructure. Uh, my switches and routers, they reduce from 19 down to four, and ultimately my transport boxes reduce from eight down to zero. R radical simplification of the network with a reduction of that gear also becomes an increase in reliability because I got less stuff in the network that can fail. There's less stuff in the network that I need to upgrade uh, in that process. And uh, I've created an opportunity for that edge traffic to be managed in a much more efficient way. And, and understand the next transformation, uh, the next layer of bandwidth uh, infrastructure that's gonna go on in a network. And the, we've watched this for years, you know, the network, it cracks me up. Uh, uh, the network used to remember not too long ago was all voice and the busiest traffic day of the, of the year was Mother's Day. Well, that's gone from voice to data 
to a big data center, and now you're going to get prep yourself for the IoT traffic and, and the rapid expansion of edge traffic. Uh, the next wave will be how do I accommodate that edge traffic, which is going to uh, force the network uh, architects to think more efficiently and more efficiently mostly about point to multipoint networks. Okay, with that in mind, understand that we've talked about transforming optics so it can do point to multipoint applications, but it doesn't, and I've got my 400 gig pluggable up here at the hub, it doesn't uh, mean that I can't talk in point to point uh, applications. So point to point is just a subset of point to multipoint. I can take these 400 transceiver, 400 gigabit transceivers and talk to 400 gigabits. And as we've shown in all of our uh, prior ICE engines, often the performance is better because of the use of these uh, subcarrier configurations. So all of a sudden I have one technology that can talk point to multipoint and can operate software configurable however I want to operate it. I can operate it in a 25 gig to 400 gig connectivity. I can operate it in a 100 gig to 100 gig connectivity, 200 to 200, 100 to 400, 400 to 400, in the future from 100 to 800. And I've created a, a language that all of my optical transceivers now can operate around, and it's called uh, the, uh, the utilization of uh, digital subcarriers that the DSP defines, and that language is, is um, uh, stable across my network, and it is up to software now to just allocate how many of those frequency channels I want to deal with. So we've done a lot of studies uh, of the use of point to multipoint technologies across a variety of networks. Uh, and it's uh, uh, whether they be point to point networks, point to multi point networks, working with a customer to go figure out how much value uh, it adds for them uh, in that. Uh, and we've had a, a number of announcements about that and happy, happy to get into that. Uh, uh, these in uh, deep detail, uh, uh, whether it was with uh, uh, early demonstrations with Virgin Media where we utilize the technology across their PON infrastructure or across their uh, rodent-based infrastructure. We showed it to work on single fiber as well as dual fiber infrastructure, which means that all the stuff that they put into the ground, uh, that they can put our transceivers on top of that infrastructure and use the configurability of that transceiver to optimize its operation. Uh, we work with British Telecom. British Telecom wanted to look at an economic analysis across uh, the wide extent of their uh, aggregation rings. Uh, and there they had uh, a, a hundreds uh, approaching a thousand aggregation rings. They evaluated it. They put on there a certain amount of uh, bandwidth uh, expansion over the coming years. And their conclusion was by adopting a point to multipoint architecture that they could dro drop the cost of their infrastructure by 76%. It's a factor of four lower cost infrastructure. Uh, the OPEX dropped uh, 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 similarly uh, due to the power reduction and the space reduction required uh, for that network. Uh, recently, we had an announcement with American Tower and, uh, and their facilities in uh, Columbia. It's actually a wonderful exchange uh, with American Tower where they asked to have the trial run multiple times in order to make sure that all their uh, executives could participate in it. Uh, there, we demonstrated the ability to uh, use point to multipoint optics uh, across their existing infrastructure so that they could upgrade the capabilities of their uh, um, connectivity to the cellular towers. We worked with a, a diverse set of customers over time and each of them have come off with a uh, substantive uh, savings. Mo most recently, not discussed in a slide here, was NBN, who we had a press announcement about uh, uh, last week. Uh, so with that, let's let's move and start uh, hearing from the customers directly, and uh, let's hear what they have to say. Hi, Andrew Lord here, um, senior manager of optical research at British Telecom, and um, have been involved with Infinera over a long period, but specifically on XR optics for the last uh, year and a half. I'm really impressed by this technology. I think it's going to go a very long way. I think the whole concept of point to multi point really fits, chimes well with uh, the kind of network um, structures that we're seeing, which are very hubbed. We're seeing um, 
capacity coming from multiple points hubbing up to a single a single data center um, and to to find a, an optical solution that mirrors that I, I think has it's got a lot of a lot of potential um, really also impressed by the professionalism of uh, Infinera who've been working with us on the the modeling simulation side as well as the uh, actual demonstration proof of concepts of, of the technology um, right the way up to the top actually we've had uh, very good access to to um, Infinera and um, We've really stuck to some some pretty hard simulations and some hard discussions uh, between the two sides. So really want to commend um, Infinera and, and um, certainly around XR Optics, the, the potential of this. I think it's very exciting going forwards and highly looking forward to seeing the product emerge. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Andrew. I uh, very much appreciate your uh, commentary and your interest in XR and how it uh, helps solve uh, British Telecom's uh, problems going forward. Uh, the commentary that Andrew shared with us is common of what we see across the customers that we've engaged in. Uh, we've engaged with almost 150 uh, service providers in, across the world uh, to date, and uh, their response is, uh, uh, very interesting in how they both see XR being able to uh, fit into the sockets that they have for point-to-point -point technology, but the uh, advancement for point-to-multi-point -point technology to be able to drive the cost structures down. The conversations that we have with our end customers also include uh, their interest in creating a multi-source uh, ecosystem around XR. With that in mind, we formed what we call OpenXR Forum. Uh, OpenXR Forum is a vehicle that is the originally being founded by service providers, of which Infinera participates in, uh, but it will expand out to include both service providers as well as OEM uh, equipment manufacturers, as well as component technology manufacturers. And Infinera's commitment to that ecosystem is we will make uh, the various layers of technology available uh, to both the MSA partners and to the service providers so that the server service providers can create a new MSA-driven standard uh, for point-to-multi-point and point-to-point -point technologies uh, going forward. The initial founders that have signed uh, the collaboration agreements, uh, and we have five service providers plus ourselves, so six uh, founding members to date, uh, and they include uh, uh, top tier service providers in Europe, top tier service providers in North America. We expect to expand uh, shortly that uh, list of uh, supporters uh, from Asia uh, to include Asia more participants in North America, more participants in uh, Europe, uh, and also as it impacts uh, the rest of the world uh, in that space. Uh, look for that over the next couple of few weeks uh, as we will be rolling out uh, uh, that, um, uh, those sets of agreements. Once the service providers uh, uh, launch this process, then the, the next phase is engaging with all the OEM manufacturers, which we have been doing over the last uh, uh, three to six months, as well as engaging with the component manufacturers, which we've actually had relationships over the past year uh, for that, in order to make the technology available from a multi-sourced environment with a technology that is not just compatible in point-to-point -point mode, but is compatible in point-to-multi-point mode, where 25 gig can talk to 100, can talk to 400, talk to 800, and, and throughout that whole chain, creating a communication pathway where all of your optical transceivers going forward can communicate. Uh, as I've indicated, we've talked with about 150 customers to date. Uh, we believe uh, we've executed a, a good number of trials uh, with those customers. Responses have all been good, and we've been able to demonstrate the technology fitting into their existing footprint so that the transition to this uh, point to XR as both a point to point and a point to multi point technology will be relatively uh, straightforward for our customers to achieve. We've also won several uh, innovation awards from the industry because the industry sees this as a shifting event uh, within the technology and it allows optics to uh, um, bring 
to the fiber optic realm, what has existed in the radio realm for years, and that is the ability for transceivers to communicate in point to multipoint and ultimately multipoint to multipoint configurations. The markets that XR optics applies to, as we pointed out earlier, well, it obviously applies to the point to point markets whether it's 100 gig point to point or 200 gig point to point or 400 gig point to point and in the future 800 gig point to point. But it's also in the transformation of those markets uh, into point to multi-point markets that we think we can expand the uh, accessibility another one to two billion dollars by 2025. Because what, uh, as you absorb the aggregation functionality into the optics, what you're doing is you're uh, uh, transitioning uh, value from that of the switching, uh, the digital switching layer and moving it to the optical aggregation layer uh, uh, for that. So if I look out to 2025, we think this is about a, a five and a half billion dollar opportunity uh, in uh, the development of these pluggable uh, optical technologies. Big opportunity, uh, big transformation because of the ubiquitous nature of XR optics across both the point-to-point -point and the point-to-multipoint applications. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and then, okay, so to, to build it, to build the technology, well, it just utilizes all the things we've done in the past, right? And all the things that Parthi talked about. It takes our uh, high-end front-end uh, technology, our optics. Uh, it takes our DSP and uh, uh, design capability. It takes our packaging technology and our manufacturing technology, but it reshuffles them into a different way. Now I'm going to go make a pluggable transceiver. I'm going to go make a QSFP style transceiver. Uh, and that, and the DSP, well, it's going to do what the DSP does, but it's going to take and manage these independent frequency channels as opposed to the alternative DSPs, which is managing single channel uh, technologies. Uh, so the DSP is, has unique math in it, but it's about the same size piece of silicon. Uh, and therefore the manufacturing cost is comparable. Uh, we take our technologies, uh, our leadership in Indian phosphide uh, technologies, and we apply it to the T-ROSA. And we make a monolithic integration of the laser, the modulator, the photo detectors, et cetera. And we also, uh, on a separate chip, we monolithically integrate all the analog electronics. So I got two chips, uh, one package technology, one cooler, et cetera, in order to put that into a common T-ROSA uh, for that uh, going forward. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, because of that, uh, we can make very small, low power, lower uh, power than uh, alternatives in the technology, higher optical power because it's based on indium phosphide technology, and ultimately lower manufacturing costs because it's based on monolithically integrated capabilities. Excuse me. Um, we integrate that all into a common package type, uh, and the net, net result is better performance, superior uh, network performance, and it's now software configurable as a separable element. It is much more akin to an intelligent uh, piece of uh, communications technology as opposed to a point-to-point -point optical pipe. Okay. So I look out to the future uh, and say, well, where's this going? Okay, we're gonna uh, create flexible subcarriers uh, and uh, build that into our, uh, the electronic management of these transceivers. They'll be implemented into a variety of technologies. The initial products that will come out are gonna be 100 gig and 400 gig uh, products, uh, and when I say 100, I mean up to 100, so that would be four 25 gig subcarriers into 100 gig, or 16 25 gig subcarriers for 400 gig, and they will be coming out in products of the CFP2 and QSFP DD, uh, and those will come out in 22. Uh, uh, as we look at the forward roadmap, we'll take the same uh, basis of the optical engine, we'll, we'll build 100 gig specific products, including QSFP28 uh, products, because we can take advantage of a much lower power uh, uh, pluggable transceiver, make higher density products uh, at the edge. Uh, we'll have our 400 gig products, and then we're gonna start with our 800 gig products. But what's unique in the industry is all those products can talk to each other. They all talk on a multiple of Nyquist subcarriers, 25 gigabit subcarriers, and therefore my 100 gig can talk to my 400 gig and to my 800 gig and my 200 gig. It doesn't matter, the communication language is common across that. Uh, and therefore, I've got one element, one manufacturing infrastructure that I can go apply across the board uh, to a diverse set of network applications, okay? 
So to wrap it up, uh, here we are. Uh, multi-point coherent optics and multi-point inclusive of point-to-point -point is a big deal. Uh, you can measure that by the type of support that we're getting around the OpenXR forum, which again, we've got a number of uh, high quality tier ones uh, across the globe, and you'll continue to see that uh, expanding over coming time. It expands our TAM, right? Because the uh, aggregation in the optical domain replaces aggregation in the electronic domain, then you the dollar opportunity is greater. That also infers that XR addresses a much larger volume uh, than uh, strictly point-to-point -point optics. Because of that volume, it will also drive manufacturing cost down. The elements are the same, volume is greater, manufacturing cost should be much less for XR in that transition. Uh, and that we've talked about what products Infinera will be uh, making, and you'll see those products hitting the uh, marketplace in 22. That, uh, thank you guys very much for your attention. Uh, go back to my original statement. I've looked at a lot of technologies over 40 years in this industry, uh, participated in many that were transformative, uh, and this point the multi-point uh, is truly transformative in the way the network uh, will play itself out over the coming years. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. We're going to take a quick, short five minute break. And when we come back, we'll resume the program with Glenn Laxdahl. Hi, my name is Glenn Laxdahl. I'm the head of product management at Infinera. I want to talk to you today about the end-to-end uh, uh, -end portfolio strategy and how we uh, integrate the optical engines that Dave and Parthi just talked about into an end-to-end -end portfolio strategy. So with that, let's get going. It starts with the uh, key market trends <clears throat> that David had referred to earlier in the presentation, but I want to pick up on some of the key themes because they're really important to us in terms of setting the framework for a portfolio strategy going forward. As we have discussed, Coherent is moving to the access edge of the network with the upgrade to 100 gig. In the metro aggregation and regional networks, those networks are upgrading to 400 gig, which drives a 400 gig coherent overlay. With 400 gig coherent overlay, you need to upgrade the metro line systems to accommodate 400 gig. In the long haul network, we see we're at the beginning of a long term shift toward the introduction of 800 gig um, across the, uh, those networks. On the competitive side, uh, we see a significant competitive disruption uh, with the um, a situation in Huawei uh, being removed uh, from the European and Asia uh, uh, operator networks over the course of the next two years to five years type timeframe. And we see a long range, long term shift toward open optical, open networking, so that operators can uh, improve the velocity of introducing new technologies into their market. So let's just drill down now on open network. Nothing new here. Um, we've seen over the last 10 to 15 years this shift toward open. Typically, what happens is we introduce new technologies in the data center, and then those new technologies propagate from the data center out into the operator networks. Let's take network function virtualization, where we separate the network function from the underlying hardware that that network function uh, operates on. Uh, the migration toward SDN, uh, in in uh, data center uh, networks. Both of those uh, ended up propagating themselves into the operator network, and we see a similar trend today in the shift toward open optical. There is a broad-based support of open and the shift to open across the operator community, and there's many forums that have been established to uh, enable the uh, momentum and the initiative behind uh, open. The Open Networking Forum, the Open Rotom, Telecom, uh, the uh, TIP project, the uh, ONAP, all of these have significant market momentum, customer momentum behind them. And customers get significant value out of this. Uh, not only does it reduce their vendor lock-in, but it, uh, uh, it, it provides them the opportunity to introduce the next generation technologies into the network very quickly. So what is optical networking? There's really two dimensions to it. One is the separation uh, or the opening of the interface between the transponder and the line system. Line systems send the optical signals to their destination. They're amplified and sent through Rotom uh, infrastructure to do the wavelength switching. The transponders provide the 
capacity, the bandwidth, 100 gig, 200 gig, 400 gig. The line systems, when they're introduced into a customer network, they tend to stay there for a long period of time. These are eight to 10 year investments. The transponders, on the other hand, they end up in, uh, uh, being introduced much more quickly in the operator network. So when we open the interface between those two, we create new insertion opportunities. On the right-hand side of the chart, you can see the um, the system that we're using, the compact modular system that we're using in, in, in open optical. Uh, it's, it's compact, it's chassis based. We can introduce new transponder sleds into this chassis based compact modular system much more quickly. The chassis stays in place, the, the sleds are, are, are introduced into the chassis. It's modular, it's modular by design and it's open by design. We use open software. We use standardized data models to be able to program that compact modular infrastructure. The combination of these two delivers significant benefits to the, to the customer and to the operator community. Reduction in vendor lock-in, improvement of the speed to introduce new technologies, uh, the ability to introduce new innovations uh, into the network that weren't contemplated before, all uh, uh, play a significant role in enabling the operator to reduce the cost per bit and to deliver next generation services. So let's talk about the size of the uh, open uh, optical uh, market. The transport market is a $10 billion market. Today about 30% of that is open optical, comprised of the compact modular system, which is a little bit less than $2 billion today, and the open line system, which is a little bit more than $1 billion today. Over time, we see that growing uh, to over 40% of the total transport market. And the most significant growth driver is really coming from Compact Modular. Compact Modular <clears throat> will grow to uh, over $3 billion by 2025, a 16% growth rate, uh, as the industry shifts toward this new building practice, this new way of deploying uh, networks. Infinera has a strong market position, a number two market share within uh, compact modular today, and we want to be able to exploit that market capability uh, going forward. We also see an industry shift um, within compact modular from the data center building practice to this technology being embraced by service providers. We already see significant traction within service providers of the compact modular uh, uh, form factor, and so that we see compact modular being used to deploy across both service provider footprint as well as data center uh, provider footprint. So let's look at Infinera's uh, flagship compact modular platform, our GX platform. We are really designing this platform to accommodate both service providers and data center providers. There are capabilities that service providers are looking for, like redundancy uh, 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 on the controller, uh, like multi-chassis capability to be able to scale up uh, to uh, very high capacities using a compact modular uh, footprint. We um, also uh, want to introduce open into the GX uh, product platform. It's open by design. We use open and standardized uh, data models so that you can program the GX portfolio or GX uh, platform from uh, an SDN controller. Our GX platform is multi-service by design. We're introducing not, not just transponder cards, but switching capabilities and line system capabilities within the, 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 the GX chassis, which gives the operator maximum deployment flexibility to be able to mix and match what functionalities they want inside this chassis and reduce the cost of deployment. On the software side, we're, we've got a common network manager framework uh, a transport SDN cloud native transport SDN controller to, to, to program the infrastructure. And from an operating uh, system perspective, we have a single converged OS that cuts across the entire GX platform that is microservice based uh, containerized infrastructure. So now how does this GX platform uh, reside uh, within the rest of the uh, Infinera networking capabilities. Starts with the optical engines. On the embedded side, uh, we have the ISICS digital coherent optical engine, the DCO, that gets integrated into a line card that then gets integrated into a GX chassis. On the pluggable side, we have the 100 gig, 200 gig, 400 gig 
point-to-point -point and point-to-multipoint pluggables that interface into modules that interface into a GX uh, chassis. The GX chassis is multi-service by design, so transponders, switching, line system capability within the GX chassis. We also are calling out here that we have three different families of GX product. The G40 product, optimized for long haul and subsea, the G30 and the G60 product, optimized for metro and uh, metro aggregation, metro access. And we have the XTM um, uh, product that I want to call out here because we've seen dramatic growth uh, in the XTM, in particular for metro access and metro aggregation capabilities over the last two years. And we'll continue to deploy the XTM footprint or the XTM product um, in conjunction with GX over time. GX will absorb the functionality of the XTM um, uh, product. So now let's look at the software that I talked about earlier on. It starts with the converged OS uh, software. It's extensible, it's microservice based, it's containerized. We can take advantage of open source software to accelerate our development and we get significant development leverage by having one common next generation operating system across the entire uh, GX product portfolio. On the network management side, we similarly are really focusing our network management and our SDN controller domain controller on delivering automation capabilities into the operator. We want to be able to deliver real-time planning and provisioning, uh, zero-touch commissioning, uh, network optimization, and bandwidth on demand. We have a very uh, uh, extensible approach to delivering, to pre-delivering capacity into a customer network and then enabling them to light up 100 gig channels as they need that capacity. So we're focused on automation, with respect to our, our software platform. And so with that, I wanna turn our attention now to some of the application uh, spaces that we're focusing on. The long haul and subsea uh, networks uh, opportunity. We've got a very strong market position in subsea, number two market position in subsea, and we've got a number two market position in long haul in North America. So we see we're building off of a very solid platform uh, for growth within, within long haul. How is the market uh, being characterized? The market is going through, the, we're at the beginning of a long-term shift toward 800 gig. In long haul, operators need to maximize their fiber assets. They need to maximize the reach performance of their, uh, of their, of their transport networks in order to get down the cost curve. And so they need to deploy the next generation technology when it's available. In Venera, <clears throat> our key strategy, our key capability here is that we've got an industry leading 800 gig product with industry leading reach and performance. We have significant market momentum building with, uh, uh, with, with our 800 gig. Um, and I'll talk to you about that here just in a minute, but significant market momentum building that we feel really good about our, our position. We have the lowest cost structure where we're introducing the I6 capability in conjunction with our G40 uh, compact modular system, an industry leading cost structure to create flexible deployment options for the operator. And finally, we're delivering all that on the C plus L band uh, Flex ILS. We've been deploying C plus L Flex ILS for the last two years. Um, and, and certainly in the last two quarters, we've seen a significant increase in demand for the Flex ILS uh, system in preparation for the deployment of uh, the ICE 6 optical engine on top of that Flex ILS. Let's talk a little bit about the life of a coherent optical engine. Um, it, it follows a remarkably consistent path. 100 gig, 200 gig, 400 gig followed this same path. The first two years of the, of, of the market introduction of a new technology, operators are taking the time uh, to test the technology, to look at the performance of the technology, to prepare their networks for that technology. And then around the year two, we start to see an inflection point where volume starts to grow um, on that next generation technology. Um, and so we're seeing that same pattern unfold on 800 gig. Uh, what we're seeing is that <clears throat> as long as you have, as a vendor, uh, you're producing the product at volume when you hit the inflection point, you're in a good position to take 
uh, advantage of the long-term growth cycle that's in front of us on, on 800 gig. The first two years after market introduction, operators are testing the technology in advance of the deployment of the technology. Where are we in terms of 800 gig? Well, we're in the first half of 2021. Um, we uh, are facing the inflection point, the knee in the curve of volume on 800 gig, uh, at, uh, heading into the 2022 timeframe. Uh, and we see ourselves also going after a really significant market opportunity. In fact, the analysts have actually increased their market size projections, now three to $4 billion for 800 gig by 2025, with further revenue growth beyond that. Um, and so we, we really feel good about our position. It's a two horse race. Um, and when you're in a two horse race um, with, with a market opportunity like this, um, I, I think that we all have uh, a pretty good uh, reason to feel optimistic about where we stand. I wanna turn our attention now to the market momentum that we've been able to drive across the G40 and an I6 uh, solution. To date, uh, we've received 22 design wins. Of those 22 design wins, we have 13 customer orders uh, in-house. We've signed up for 57 uh, customer trials. We're undertaking customer trials in Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4, uh, as customers are testing out the technology and looking for the opportunities to deploy the technology. We have a very global footprint, as you can see from the map of these, uh, both customer wins as well as customer trials. And we see uh, the ramp phase really happening in the second half of 2021, and we wanna be at volume as we head into 2022. Based on the visibility that we have today, we feel comfortable saying that 20 to 25 percent of our revenue, um, of our product revenue, is going to be coming from this I6 optical engine uh, in the 2022 timeframe. So we feel pretty good about our position, and we think there's lots of opportunities in front of us on 800 gig. Let's turn our attention now to Metro Networks and 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 really the. The, uh, in the metro is where we see the most significant disruption uh, going, going forward. A tremendous data growth uh, from 5G, from distributed access uh, cable architectures, from enterprise bandwidth growth. Um, and that, that growth in, the, in data traffic is really driving uh, this, this move of, of, uh, of coherent optics. The metro, the metro aggregation and regional networks are being upgraded from 100 gig and 200 gig to 400 gig. That upgrade to 400 gig will drive a necessary upgrade of the line system from the existing fixed grid, 50 gigahertz fixed grid uh, infrastructure to a flex grid infrastructure. So a significant investment is required to enable the migration of 400 gig. We also see 100 gig moving out and coherent moving out with 100 gig to the very access edge of the network. And we see an insertion opportunity from the competitive displacement of Huawei in Europe and, and Asia. The Infinera strategy is clear. We're going after this opportunity with um, our multi-service GX-based compact mod modular product platform. We're delivering our high performance point-to-point uh, -point and point-to-multi-point uh, optical engines in 100 gig, 200 gig, 400 gig. And with the introduction of the point to multi-point optical engine, we really see an opportunity to increase the TAM that we're going after. Uh, it's a new market. It's being created by the disruption in the access networks in particular with 5G and DAA, and this creates a, a new way of, of networking. We also want to deliver an automation framework across both the point to point and the point to multi-point network infrastructure that we'll, that we'll be deploying. So with that, I want to uh, segue over to a customer testimonial from EU Networks. Hi there, I'm Andrew Holder, CTO of EU Networks. As a company, we concentrate on delivering bandwidth services in Western Europe. We want to be the category owner for bandwidth infrastructure services for our true fans by consistently del over delivering on one or two key benefits. And in order to do this, we need to be flexible, responsive and innovative when providing solutions and services.
Infineera is one of EU Network's key technology partners that allow us to serve customers that are consuming multi-terabits in capacity and keep pace with big content ICP customers that are seeing bandwidth doubling every year. From a network operator perspective, every platform decision is a commitment for many, many years. The expansion of open optical networking decouples vendor decisions from lock-ins, allowing us to select vendors that are at the forefront of technology innovation. This allows us both to be early adopters of new technology and to serve our customers' needs, bringing a mix of economic and performance considerations, or in simpler terms, a greater value proposition to our customers. Infineera's silicon photonic integration in their ICE DSPs are now in their fourth generation in the EU network's network. We're about to test the performance of the latest ICE 6 800G generation on our new European ultra low loss terrestrial and subsea routes, connecting Ireland, the UK, and the European continent. A key decision. A key decision-making criteria when doing this is Infineera's commitment to open architectures, which includes the use of the newest ICE technology and into working with our existing photonic systems. The use of Infineera's own CNL band flex ILS system in open line system solutions and the openness of interfaces into Infineera's DNA management system for process automation with our customers allows us to develop APIs and embed ourselves in some of our key customers' environments as we grow meaningful partnerships with our true fans. The pace of change in transponder technology continues to increase all the time and working with an innovative partner as Infineera that is willing to accept and embrace this point is fundamental to how we keep growing successfully together. Finally, Infineera's investment in the life cycle management and operation of these environments is one that is so often overlooked, but it's key when planning, deploy, deploying, and in-life service management is so vital to maintaining the necessary service responses to our customers. I want to shift gears now and talk about our go-to-market. We've talked about our portfolio strategy. Now, how are we going to get that portfolio strategy to market? First, it starts with global presence. We have local presence in more than 30 countries globally, where we have uh, services operations um, to uh, maintain and manage customer networks. And there's um, a, a focus that we're gonna be putting across certain areas of the, of the customer space, starting with the top 50 service provider customers. The top 50 service provider customers spend 75% of the CapEx. We wanna increase our focus on those top 50 and continue to grow our share within the, within the top 50. We wanna increase our focus and grow share within the data center operator space. And we think we have the technology to enable us to do that. We wanna take the 800 gig optical engine and grow share within uh, long haul and subsea uh, markets. We want to grow our wallet share in Europe and, and Asia from the competitive disruption uh, of Huawei. And we think that we've got a strong portfolio uh, to enable us to do that. And we want to use our transformative point to multi-point solution to go after the disruption that's happening uh, in the access networks from 5G and DAA. The global presence enables us to go after a global market opportunity, to take advantage of the product capabilities that we're developing and ensure that we can insert those uh, product capabilities broadly and globally across the networks. So let's just summarize now. Uh, I've covered the open optical portfolio, the uh, i6 program update, uh, the customer traction that we've uh, been uh, driving. And I really just want to summarize quickly. Uh, we're focusing on the transformation to open and open optical. We're focusing on taking our next generation compact modular portfolio and driving it, uh, that multi-service portfolio, and driving it across uh, long haul, subsea, metro, and metro access networks. We want to uh, focus on exploiting that that open optical uh, uh, networking portfolio. We see the ramp of I6 in particular uh, in long haul and, and subsea networks, and we're on the beginning of a long cycle 
of ramping uh, I-6. We want to win share in long haul and subsea, as well as in metro networks, and we want to really focus our go-to-market to enable us to win in those, in those key areas that we've discussed. So with that, I'll hand it over to Nancy. Thanks, Glenn. I'm Nancy Erba, and I'm the Chief Financial Officer at Infinera, and I'm pleased to be speaking with you today about the financial roadmap for the company. You've heard from David, from Parthi, Dave, and Glenn about the really exciting opportunity in front of the company right now. We are seeing very strong underlying demand. Um, we are in a position with our new product introductions that position us really well for the very unique competitive landscape that we are currently operating in. We have shown um, in the previous discussions, the importance of vertical integration, the importance of the investments that we're making in our technology. And as a reminder, the company was founded on the belief that vertical integration was key to success in the market, in that it allows us to deliver a lower cost per bit to our customers and to deliver value to our shareholders in terms of the financial model it enables for us. We're seeing an accelerated shift to open optical, positioning us well as our product roadmap intersects um, and is aligned right now as we're entering into this really exciting and dynamic space. And finally, in the market, you're hearing about and witnessing the scarcity of the technology that we are investing in. And so all of this combined makes us as a team really excited and motivated to go out and win in the marketplace. As I look at my priorities, having been here now almost two years, and what is enabling us to, to generate improvements in our business model and to drive value, I think of it in two parts. The first is around financial fitness. We've been working to strengthen our financial model. We're doing this through people, our team that we're building, process improvements, and increased automation. We've been relentless in our focus on cost reductions, particularly as we were moving through the integration of the Corian acquisition. And finally, we've been focused on how we look at our deal structures. When we're um, responding to bids from customers, we want this to be a win-win. We want it to be a win for our customer, and we want it to be a win for Infinera. So there's more discipline in that process internally. We are focused on being consistent and, predi and predictable in our execution for our customers in terms of the product commitments that we're making, in terms of operationally, making sure that we are really functioning as an excellent organization, whether that's in our internal processes or externally as we're working in the market. And then finally, forecast accuracy. All of this combines to make sure that we are providing uh, broadly um, a consistent and predictable uh, forecast for people to measure us against. This all enables growth and then shareholder value. We're at focusing our investment opportunities in the areas you've heard about today. We're investing in those key technologies that are going to enable us to make sure that we are, have the, the largest and maximized insertion opportunities and we're focusing these investments in the fastest growing segments of the market, which is again aligned to our roadmap. All of this leads to increased shareholder value. We expect to be growing faster than the market. We expect to continue to expand our gross margins. And then of course, to be um, utilizing our capital efficiently. And I'll walk you through uh, the next several years in terms of our approach there. If I look at the progress that we've made in the last three years, I'm very proud of the work that the team has done, and I mean a combined team. This is a truly cross-functional effort. We have been uh, uh, measuring ourselves and looking at the trailing 12-month improvement in terms of gross margin, operating margin, and cash flow from operations. All of these bars are up and to the right, which is positive, but we're not done in terms of the metrics for any of these. If I look at gross margin, we are on track 
to achieve 300 to 400 basis points improvement in 2021 versus 2020. If you look at this chart, uh, in, 20, in Q1 of 20, there was a dip in our gross margin. And those of you who have been with us re will recall, we had won a very large subsea deal in that quarter. And that had um, a challenge to our margin as we were laying footprint. But we are now filling that footprint and the margin associated with that deal is above our corporate average. And most importantly, you see the upward and to the right trend. Similarly, on, operational, on uh, operating margin, uh, we have now shown three consecutive quarters of non-GAAP operating profit, but we want to do more. We want to continue to have that sustained profitability. We want to continue to be generating cash on a consistent basis. We are going to look at cost reductions as we do on an ongoing basis, always focused on how do we do more, how do we do better to drive that margin improvement. And on cash flow, we have seen substantial improvement year over year on our cash flow from operations. 2020 was a year where we had over $80 million in one-time cash outflows that were associated with the integration work we had done in 2019. Those are now behind us. And at the same time in 2020, we focused on our working capital. We improved our uh, working capital metrics in AR, AP, as well as in inventory. And we are on a path to continue to drive cash through working capital. This is all work to establish a pattern, again, of consistent execution, of improvement year over year, and to show steady progress toward our target business model. The gross margin and operating margin shown here are non-GAAP, and we will have a gap to non-GAAP reconciliation with the slides that we post. This financial progress can also be seen in our stock performance. So this graph shows uh, this, the Infinera stock versus our peers starting in Q4 of 2018, which was the first quarter of the combined Infinera and Coriant uh, team. We have outperformed uh, our peer index. We've done it in a period of a pandemic, which was very challenging for the entire industry and the entire global community. And although we're pleased that we outperformed, we're not done here either. We are still moving forward to our target business model. And what I'll talk to you um, about next is not just that model, but what we have beyond that in terms of upside opportunity um, as we look at creating additional shareholder value. So David opened uh, our meeting today and he shared our target business model. And he stated, and I'm confirming here, that we are on track to achieve our target business model in 2023. That includes growing faster than the market at eight to 12%. That includes increasing our vertical integration to approximately 60% in this period of time. That includes gross margins that are in the mid 40s and double dig digit operating margin. We've been sharing with you um, pretty consistently our view that this is a target that we should be able to achieve. Um, we are now uh, confirming uh, our belief that it will be in 2023. And I'm also going to talk to you about what's beyond this as well. So if I start with revenue and our approach and, and looking at the market to grow at three to four times the current market forecast. I'll start with services, um, the, the baseline here in the, in the orange bar. Services represents about 20% of our revenue, and it's consistent in its growth at approximately 5%. A good, steady, strong business for us. Glenn shared with you the breadth of our service offerings and the complexity of the, of the challenges that we're facing globally in this current environment. But we're really pleased with the work that's been done there and that steady baseline for us. The next bar is the metro uh, market, and we've talked quite a bit today about the opportunities that we have in this space that we are going after. We've announced our 400 gig product, and this is one of the key areas where we see the ability for us to gain share with the current competitive uh, disruptions in the market. The blue on the top is our uh, long haul and subsea. 
And Glenn shared with you our approach and where we are in terms of I-6 and the launch. Um, in, on this chart, I've highlighted for you a representation of the product revenue associated with 800 gig. We've been really consistent in our comments that we believe the ramp of this product will begin in the second half of this year, and it will continue to grow from here. So I have included in 2022, you can think about 20 to 25% of our product revenue coming from 800, 800 gig in 2022, and then continuing to grow from there. The purple on the very top of this bar chart represents the point to multipoint XR opportunity. And Dave Welch shared with us his view and our team's view on the opportunity that this market could represent for us. I've chosen to take a pretty conservative view here um, in, in terms of XR. So I would say there, there is upside from here. What I've done, and I believe what you want me to do, is we have built this model uh, from the bottom up, meaning we're looking at where we are today and our outlook for the next couple of years by program, by customer, by region. And that is what this revenue growth is built off of. So there is good growth, eight to 12% on a kegger, um, and that is three to four times the market, as I mentioned. But it does not, um, I would say it is, it is a baseline view that I feel is achievable and that we've built from the bottom up. Moving now to gross margin. We've talked today quite a bit about vertical integration, one of the founding principles of the company. And today, um, as, as we sit, we're at about 40% of our products being vertically integrated. We expect to end the year in the 40 to 45% range. As I look forward, by 2023, I would see that at about 60%. And beyond that in 2025, 70% or higher. This is key as it is one of the prime drivers for the expansion in gross margin that we are expecting to see. We have started uh, this year exiting 2020 at 33.8%. And we have um, been consistent in our message that we expect that to grow 300 to 400 basis points this year. On this chart, you see the, the balance of gross margin, right? It's pluses and it's minuses. It's the benefit of increased vertical integration. It's the benefit that we see from the cost reductions that we have been able to achieve. It's the benefit in the operating leverage in our model. And that's balanced with challenges as well at any period in time. Right now, we have supply headwinds that we are facing um, as an industry and certainly um, at Infinera, which we have talked about. Additionally, as you have a higher weighting of line systems deployed in a quarter, that puts pressure on your margin. So these 300 to 400 basis points improvements year over year from 20 to 21 and all the way through 23 are a balance and a mix of the revenue build that, we sh that I showed in the last slide. What's beyond the mid 40s? I get asked quite a bit about that. It's like, so you hit the 40s, then what? Um, first and foremost, this team, you're hearing from us today and the broader Infinera team, we are focused on getting to our target business model in 2023. But what I wanna also show is that beyond that, there is opportunity. Drivers for this upside are things like increased uh, market share versus what I have built in here. Um, an increase in the level of vertical integration that we see in the metro market, an increase in, in the um, achievability and the growth that we see in the XR space. All of these will contribute to us moving beyond the mid 40s in terms of our gross margin to the high 40s and approaching 50%. Bringing this together now to an operating model We've talked about revenue and the revenue growth of eight to 12%. Again, three to four times the market growth. We've talked about gross margin and the step function improvements that we anticipate making from 2020 at 33.8% to 2020 in the mid 40s. And then beyond that, as we are able to execute on the upside opportunities that I referenced. If I roll in OPEX, 
and I look at 2023 as our target model, I see R&D in the 18 to 20% range, allowing us to continue to invest in our key technologies and make sure that we are intersecting the market at the right time, that we are bringing to our customers products that um, give them a lower total cost of ownership and allow for us to be able to generate double digit operating margin. As I look to 2025, I've pulled, I have not included any additional operating leverage that would come from a higher revenue base and a higher margin base. And here I show mid-teens in terms of um, opportunity beyond our double digit operating margin. So this model that we are driving is consistent with what we have been um, speaking to you about. It uh, generates a good, strong cash flow, giving us the ability to continue the, the investments that we need and create options in terms of um, our capital allocation. And it also shows that we have upside from this point. Um, and with the strong drivers that we see in the market, we are excited about this opportunity and we are driven as a team to go out and win. So my key takeaways, um, certainly compelling growth drivers in the market. You've heard about it from every single one of us today. We're excited about the market opportunity. It is a unique time and place in the optical market and one in which we plan to go out and, um, and execute upon and to drive further growth, further profitability and further value to our, for our shareholders. We have planned to achieve our, our target business model in 2023 with upside from there. And we, um, we are excited about and motivated by the work that's being done at Infinera every single day. So I wanna thank you for joining us today. Thank you for, for your support um, as our investors, um, as analysts who follow us. Um, welcome new investors who may be hearing our message for the first time. And we believe that we have a compelling value proposition in the company. We've done great work to this point. We are at just the beginning, as you have seen, of the opportunity um, for growth drivers that we believe are very compelling and are very much aligned with our roadmap. And we are excited to continue the journey with you. So with this, I will hand the um, microphone over to David Hurd for some closing comments before we open up for Q&A. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. That was terrific. Hopefully everybody's hung with us through this uh, period. Uh, hopefully by hanging with us and really getting some of the subledger detail about our business. One, you're getting our enthusiasm and passion for this business. Two, you understand that there's favorable market dynamics, that we do have a winning strategy, that vertical integration does matter, and innovation that matters for our customer, that, that drives real economics in the network, and that you got the team here to execute. And this same team, after a short break, is gonna be reared up and ready to go to answer your questions. Thank you. Okay, uh, welcome back everybody. I hope you found the presentations this morning highly insightful and informative. And I hope you're getting a sense and a flavor of why we're so excited at Infinera when we look at the opportunities in front of us. You know, whether it's the shift to open optical, whether it's coherent moving all the way to the edge, the ramp of 800 gig, the opportunities in Metro that you heard us talk about this morning, and obviously the potential for a new addressable market with our XR optics technology. So what we're gonna do now is move into the Q&A portion. And as I said in my opening remarks, we are gonna limit the Q&A, the live Q&A portion to our cell site analysts. And what I'd request of all the cell site analysts is please limit yourselves to one question and one follow-up. We'll try to get through as many questions as we can. We also see some questions coming in the Q&A chat channel. We'll try to get to a couple of those uh, time permitting. Uh, we're also gonna push out an, an event survey on the chat channel. Uh, please, 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 if you could fill that out, uh, that would be highly appreciated. Uh, we take your feedback very seriously and it gives us a sense on how to sort of adapt uh, future events. Uh, and you'll see all the speakers uh, on video. Uh, we've also invited Rob Shore, our Senior VP of Marketing, to join us for the Q&A portion. Many of you have heard from Rob. 
recently in our webinars, the tech talks we've been doing. Uh, and so Rob's also going to join us for the Q&A portion. So with that, why don't we jump in? Uh, I'm going to turn the first question to Rod Hall of Goldman Sachs. Uh, Rod, when, if you can, please uh, turn your camera on and your audio. And uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, great. Thanks, Amitabh. Can you guys see me okay? Yep. And hear me. Um, so I, I, the first question I wanted to address to Dave um, on the XR technology, I wonder if you could, Dave, kind of lay out to us, I get that you're talking about that taking TAM from the existing routing switching layer and aggregation, but could you talk a little bit about how that technology affects that overall optical TAM within the, you know, the metro and aggregation layers and, and why that happens architecturally. And then I, I have a follow-up for Nancy. Well, I think that the, the TAM in a dollar sense, you know, is, is really driven by uh, uh, how, to, how to build the infrastructure uh, for all these new uh, higher bandwidth edge, edge capabilities, whether it's 5G or IoT or, or uh, you know, uh, fiber deep type of, type of architecture. So that uh, the, the uh, cost, uh, the TAM uh, gets driven by how fast and how rapidly uh, companies want to absorb it. What they're looking for is the simplest, uh, uh, most cost-effective solution to allow them to uh, uh, put more and more bandwidth uh, on network. Uh, what, XR, what XR does in that is it, it, it simplifies the problem. Right, uh, it uses the optical layer for the actual aggregation of information, uh, as opposed to uh, having to go through an electronic box. And uh, in that sense, it, uh, it it moves the the uh, uh, emphasis towards the optical layer. Uh, those optical elements are become much more of a, uh, a critical path, uh, intelligent uh, element within the network uh, in that process. Okay, great, thanks. I, I know that one of the historic problems with that is the grooming of the traffic on the optical layer, but I guess we'll probably get into that, you know, as we go through the call here. Um, the, the question for Nancy, Nancy, if you look back, I was curious at your 70% your vertical integration and then your gross margins that, um, you know, that correspond to that out in 2025. By the way, thanks for that roadmap, because I thought it was super clear, but I'm curious whether, um, does that, correspond back to that 2015 to early 2016 period when you guys did peak for a couple quarters there at 50% gross margins. Uh, do you think the gross margin contribution from vertical integration is similar to that period? Or do you think some, you know, something's changed between then and, and now from a fab utilization or, you know, other perspective? Uh, yeah. So, I mean, I would start with this team here where we're first focused on let's get to the 40 Let's get a four in the gross margin handle. Um, that's our first focus and get to our target model. Um, that roadmap, you know, beyond 23, what it's designed to show is that there's continued growth from that mid 40s. And, you know, you're referencing back historically when the company had a very high percentage of its products vertically integrated and was able to achieve margins in the 50s. Um, you know, I don't see anything that's stopping us from doing that. But again, we first have to get Let's get to the target model and then let's go from there. Yeah, you don't know. Could you say what the vertical integration rate was back when you, you know, hit 50%? Was it? I think it was above 80. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hey, thanks, Rob. Okay. Uh, why don't we move to Meta Marshall of Morgan Stanley? Meta? Great. Thanks. Um, maybe a couple of questions for me. One, just with the XR optics, um, you know, roadmap that you laid out and the market opportunity that you laid out, you know, is there like a target percentage of the pond opportunity that you think is kind of addressable within that TAM? Um, and then maybe second question, you know, obviously you guys laid out a pretty extensive roadmap today, but we didn't hear anything about 1.2 terabit. And I just wanted to know, is that a part, something that you would be planning on investing in, or you know, you think 800 gig has a long enough roadmap that um, you know you you might skip that cycle. Thanks. So maybe we'll have Dave take the XR, and then uh, Parthi, I'll defer the second question to you. Yeah, great. Yeah, the the um, 
So uh, there's a couple questions that we, we've seen in and around pond. So understand what uh, uh, what XR is able to do is create is operate over a uh, passive optical infrastructure or a pond infrastructure. However, the uh, the bandwidth on where it really proves in is uh, looks more like a 10 gigabit at the edge than a one or sub one gigabit uh, at the edge. Uh, and so in uh, the initial application, it's really about uh, overlays on pond infrastructure to be able to access uh, uh, business groups, et cetera, that have the capacity uh, uh, driving on there. So I want to look at it at so much as a percentage of the of the uh, residential pond marketplace, I would look at it as an added value feature that sits on top of that infrastructure to be able to access high, higher value targets within that same uh, geography. Okay. Uh, yeah. And uh, if, uh, Parthi, are you there? Yeah, I'm, I'm here uh, with, with yeah. reference to uh, uh, the embedded engines and 1.2. Uh, I, uh, there, there are two points I'd like to make one, Yes, we do see 800 gig uh, technology uh, having a large uh, life cycle, if you will. And as I, if you recall my presentation, uh, we talked about how there's a lot of transition happening from 200 gig to 800 gig. So we believe it's a large market and it's a long market. Uh, having said that, if you also refer, uh, recall the slide, we talked about beyond I-6 and we referred to I-7. Uh, I, I should have elaborated more. I-7 is our engine to get 1.2 and beyond. And what we are working on is to continuously push uh, both the capacity. We would like to target 1.6, uh, but we are also cautious about what we, we commit ourselves to. So I-7 is 1.2 and above. Uh, and truly it's not just about 1.2 terabits but how far you can take 1.2 terabit, just like we've taken uh, 800 gig to a substantial reach. Got it. And if I could just get in one last uh, follow up for Nancy, just on the eight to 10% CAGR target that you laid out, is that starting in 20 or 21? Uh, starting in 22. So our um, statements that we made at our um, last couple of earnings calls where we see 21 growing slightly above the current market growth, um, those stand firm. Um, this is really beyond 21, the 8 to 12 percent. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Meta. And just, uh, yeah. Yeah, go ahead, David. I was just going to say 8 to 12 percent. And right. I just want to uh, add on to uh, to Rod's comment, too, because I think he had a question on kind of fabulization and how that uh, how our cost structure goes up against that vertical integration percentage. One thing to kind of note is we've always used our vertical integration capabilities for high capacity engines, which has served us very well, our core competency. And again, there's fewer and fewer players that can compete at that speed and at those economics. The, the, big, the big news for us from a business model perspective to that, uh, to that vertical integration percentage is now when you're making pluggables, uh, both the TROSs that could be used for ZR, ZR, or, or ZR Plus as well as XR, the number of uh, the utilization goes way up because obviously, as you get closer to the edge of the network, the points of presence go up, and so that's a nice additive and accretive part of our, you know, leveraging our vertical integration capabilities in our packaging and fab capability. Sorry, I'm not done for jumping in there. Hey, no, no worries, David. Uh, let's move on to Alex Henderson of Needham. Uh, Alex, go ahead. Great, thank you very much. Um, I, I wanted to, to, to delve into the implications of the XR in a, in a, in a much broader format. I mean, clearly uh, as a standalone product, it's a very interesting product. But as you know, and I think uh, is clearly uh, well established among most people paying attention in this market, service providers by roadmap. And um, I guess my question is to what extent does the XR have a halo effect even long before it's launched in impacting uh, the purchasing decision and changing you from a point products company to one that's much more strategic, particularly as you start talking about the ability of XR 
uh, to talk about 100 gig to 400 gig aggregation across maybe a metro environment um, as opposed to just on the edge, which is further out in the roadmap, but clearly part of what the uh, your uh, lay what you laid out. So, uh, how important is this changing perceptions of the company? Uh, David Hurd, do you want to take that first, and then maybe Dave Welch can add on? Yeah, I would say uh, uh, spot on, Alex. Uh, people buy roadmap and and are trying to prepare their architectures for this data center, mobile edge compute dearth of bandwidth that continues on, on the edge and need that dynamic policy on the edge to make sure that they can shift traffic around in a very unknown environment. And so, yeah, as we're out looking at things like the Huawei insertion opportunity, that's half of that opportunity is, is Metro. And as people look to change their Metro architectures right now, yeah, they have to change the grid spacing anyway as they go to 400 gig. And so they look for new suppliers. Uh, they're looking to potentially replace Huawei in, in some jurisdictions. So they're looking for new architectures and new vendors. And so they're not just looking at what box do you have today, but they're looking uh, for what solution do you have? How do, does that impact their economics, both CapEx and OpEx? And as Dave went through, uh, those, those areas are pretty profound which is why we're uh, coming out more public and you're seeing this as an open architecture for us. And Dave will talk more about, you know, that XR open forum and getting 150 customers worth of feedback over the last 18 months into this architecture. You lay it out now because people buy roadmap and they've got to address this architecture on the edge today. Dave. Yeah. So, the, you know, there, uh, Alex or, uh, two slides that I want to refer to, which uh, I call them the trip to the data center, right? And, uh, and the trip to the data center goes from, you know, the radio unit in the case of 5G, goes from the radio unit, goes to, to a low latency local data center, uh, and then it goes to the regional data center. Uh, the implications of XR, to, to your question, the implications of XR uh, in that uh, specific application are huge. Uh, they are completely game-changing in the way that the uh, uh, carrier can uh, reconstruct how that network uh, evolves, and it enables them to put higher value-added services in their existing infrastructure, right? It frees up power and space so they can move and take advantage of, and deploy their uh, local cloud infrastructure uh, in order to realize a greater revenue uh, opportunity. That is highly strategic uh, to, these, to these customers uh, in that. And so in that particular application, and, 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 uh, and as you get into, well, you know, when's all this play out? It's critical to, to understand that it plays out, uh, the, the hardware can play out immediately because it fits and applies to all point-to-point -point applications, which the current network is architected around. But by choosing a communication language that says, yep, the, info, info, the stuff I'm gonna stick in the ground in 22 can be transformed uh, to absorb uh, over time. And, and so I gotta go have a phone call with my radio supplier and said, hey, I need, I don't want a 25 gig SFP optical plug in my radio. I want a QSFP 28 plug in my radio, right? Uh, which the, the radio provider is more than happy to do. And when you do that, all of a sudden you can carry XR from the edge to the data center and, and see that complete uh, transformation, front hall, back hall, uh, data center uh, orientation. It's, it's uh, I, you know, I said in my earlier comment, there isn't a single optical network, including the data center, that doesn't need to be rethought because uh, we've utilized for the past, you know, 50 years electronic switches to do our aggregation, whereas this now allows the optical layer to do the aggregation. Yeah, if I could follow up a question off of this, there's not much mention of 400 gig ZR. Clearly uh, that's designed to take out a DWDM platform and push it uh, into the switch router. Uh, my presumption is that service providers will always choose to go 
wherever they can on the optical layer and only switch route when they absolutely have to because the cost is so much higher. Uh, this seems like it's a counterpoint to ZR. So can you talk a little bit about those two as point counterpoint? Yeah, so uh, uh, the application of ZR plus, which is 400 gig point to point, uh, within a metro sized environment. XR does that, right? So in the world of I'm, I'm a service provider, I'm gonna deploy in the case where I'm gonna deploy bookended solution, XR does everything that a ZR plus. ZR plus is a subset of the specifications of XR uh, in that. Uh, in, in, uh, but XR offers a wealth of other uh, advantages and because of those advantages, it will drive in uh, a wealth of other applications and volume uh, into that space that ZR Plus can't. Uh, they can't do that. And as a result, it will become a, a larger scale, lower cost manufacturing uh, uh, capability in them. So the, the point to point capabilities uh, were fully supported. We will make uh, XR and CFP2s, which plug in the transport boxes. We'll make XR in a QSFP DD format, which will plug in the switch and routers for customers that want to utilize optics and switches and routers. You know, and they have that choice for that. The, um, but what it, uh, uh, and what Open XR is to do is to create, um, to satisfy the customer's need for a common language for these transponders to talk to each other. But the language that you want to stabilize on is the one that can talk low speed interface to high speed interface, multi-generational languages, as opposed to uh, a 400 my part versus your part. It's far more valuable. And, and this is, uh, uh, um, you know, our, the response to the OpenXR uh, forum, which is fully compatible with the, uh, uh, open Rotom type of uh, architectures and uh, uh, you know open optical infrastructure concepts, but it's the OpenXR forum that creates a new standard of communication across uh, from the edge, the high, uh, the greater than ten gigabit capacity edge, all the way to the high capacity regional data center uh, in there. Yeah, I would I would actually just kind of when when you boil it down. Uh, you know, we're fully supportive of ZR plus, you know, we have not traditionally been able to do our own optics in the Metro. And so we've had to buy merchant from uh, other players that everybody knows out there, which means a margin stack of 45% plus uh, that we've got to take on to our margin structure. You saw when we bought Corient, they had a lot of merchant integration that we're making our way back from. I think the big news here is this allows us to have you know, it's built compliant to the ZR plus uh, direction. So if we're going to go point to point, we get our own uh, vertical integration capability when we think the market will really be there. So, you know, if you kind of look at the market size of ZR, ZR plus today and into 2022, it will be building and the meat of the market will really be at 23, 24 and, and 25 and us introducing parts in 2022 and, and starting revenue and really 2023 and 2024 gives us that margin uh, bump that Nancy talked about in the business model, which we've never had before because we didn't have the affordability to do our own pluggable T-Rosa, which is roughly 60% to 65% of that bill of material, as well as uh, our own DSP to address the Metro. Well, we changed that 18 months ago, right? We started investing along these lines. Hey, Clear as you. a bell. Thanks guys that's, for a great answer. I appreciate it. Thanks, Alex. Uh, just a quick reminder, please. We do have the survey out there. So if you guys can fill that on as you're listening, that would be great. Uh, let's move to John uh, Marchetti of Stiefel. Thanks very much. Uh, I appreciate some of the metrics that you shared with us today around the early adoption of, uh, of 800 gig and some of the momentum that you're showing there. Was curious if you could categorize or help us understand kind of maybe where we are in terms of the cloud guys who clearly are, are typically early adopters of these types of, of, of transitions versus maybe what we're seeing today in, in that telco market, particularly in, in, in long haul and sub C. Glenn, uh, I'll give that one to you, Glenn Lockdahl. It's, <clears throat> no, thanks, thanks for the question. It's actually very broad based. Um, we've got a uh, pretty good traction 
Um, as, as we said in the presentation today, 2022 20, design wins. Uh, we've got, as of today, 14 uh, purchase orders uh, in-house. And it's pretty much equally split between uh, ICPs and, and CSPs and, and then uh, uh, subsea. I would say that, that there's tremendous momentum on the subsea side, good momentum on the, on the CSP side, and really good momentum in, in ICPs as well. Um, we're doing, uh, and we expect you know, that uh, uh, to increase over the course of the year. We've got um, good momentum both on the trial side, on the certification side, as well as the expected deployment side uh, going forward. So I think our key message here is it's equally balanced across ICPs and, and CSPs and, and a lot of momentum in particular right now on the subsea side. Great, thank you. And, and Nancy, maybe for you, you know, given the, the goal from a growth perspective and, and a good chunk of that is predicated on winning share in both that long haul and subsea market, and. Should we think of, of margins being volatile as we go forward? You know, still within your, your, your sort of longer term growth targets there. But I think back to what did happen a few quarters ago when you won that big subsea business and, and that took a, then a sort of a surprise step back before we were able to move forward again. Just curious is as we're moving to I6 and, and more of the module platforms you know, driving this, does that smooth some of that out or should we expect some inherent lumpiness, even as we're marching toward that three or 400 basis points per year? Uh, it's a good question. And, you know, as we talked about even just Q3 um, with the line system deployments that have been happening, we've had um, near record uh, wins here in deployments that you're starting, you, you may see that in Q3, right? We talked about a, a little bit lower gross margin in Q3. I think what's different now versus a year ago in that Q120 is um, our visibility, our, our ability to, as you said, you know, start as the vertical integration is growing, smooth some of that, but there will be lumpiness. And what we're trying to do is be more transparent about it and give you visibility ahead of time. So to be able to say, hey, this next quarter or two, you know, you may see um, some pressure on margin because of these line system deployments. But as that vertical integration grows, um, you know, to your point, it, it does help to mitigate some of that. Thank you. Thanks, Sean. All right, uh, we'll move over to Jeff Caval from Wolf. Hi, can you uh, hear me and see me okay? We can, hey, Jeff. Yeah. Oh, wonderful. It's my first video back in the office and you know, honest, ironically, the kinks are here now, no longer at the home office, so. <laughs> um, okay, I guess, Two questions for you. Uh, I think the first is uh, sort of more tactical, and that is, you spent a lot of time talking about share gains from from Huawei, which makes a decent amount of sense given that they are the largest player in the market, particularly in the in the long haul markets. Um, you didn't spend as much time talking about share gains from the number two and number three players in the market, and and I'm wondering. Is that a part of your eight to twelve percent long-term CAGR, or, or how, how should we think about that? It's a good. It's a good question. I think we highlight Jeff the Huawei opportunity because I think in prior earnings calls everybody kept asking us, "Can you please depict that a bit?" So uh, we're trying to be empathetic in our communications. Uh, certainly, if if we're going to grow uh, at two to three times uh, the market over that period, we we intend to take share, and we're an equal opportunity share taker. So, um, you know, we think that uh, we, we think that uh, the Huawei opportunity certainly is right in front of us, but it's really an eight by four by one. It's at eight hundred gig. Uh, there are great insertion opportunities in the core metro, uh, metro core, and subsea. Uh, that will be a long cycle that we'll be able to take share in. Uh, and that'll be against the, the competitive field. Uh, and, and it's, you know, as you go to the 400 gig in the Metro, people are going to be changing their grid spacing as well as the Huawei opportunity. And uh, we believe we're positioned to be able to take share there against the field. Uh, and that field is, is a bit broader than the, the 800 gig at this point in time. And, uh, and then at the 100 gig, I think uh, Dave mentioned, and I think Alex brought up uh, the point that people are really buying 
as they prepare for the metro access and aggregation edge, they're buying on roadmap and looking at total cost of ownership. And not only the ability to kind of uh, take our own destiny of vertical integration uh, in, in our margin structure over, but this ability to move from point to point to point to multipoint uh, is very important. And that's where we intend to disrupt. And the share take there and the creation of new TAM actually may come, as others insinuated, from outside the, the optical market. So that billion or two billion is on top of the existing optical market. Did, did that help, Jeff? Yes, thank okay. you very much, very delicately put. Um, and then my second question is uh, really on that point of multipoint, so perhaps maybe for Dave, but you know, the, as you were pointing out, the concept of point to multipoint is, is not, not new and my history in the industry is 20 years and the period it predates me. So I guess, what is it about the optical space that makes now the time for point to multipoint to become uh, a meaningful concept in optical. So, so uh, 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 real quickly, you know, it's interesting to look at in comparing radio communications and optical communications. Uh, radio, you know, whether it's your FM radio, your Wi-Fi antenna, your cellular tower, they all work in point to multipoint applications. Optics was never developed that way, and it had two actually two shortcomings. Point to point in each generation only talk to its own generation, 10 to 10, 20 to 5 to 2,500 to 100. What's different now is the, co is the coherent, the DSP, that piece of silicon that is integrated into the uh, 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 coherent module has the power and the capability to be able to create independently managed frequency channels within the bandwidth of the optics. That couldn't have been done before. Uh, and it's really that uh, uh, you've got, uh, as the silicon nodes have come down, you know, 16 nanometers, seven nanometers, going to five and three, et cetera, you can put the processing power necessary to manage each of those in frequency channels independently. So that's why now the application has always been there. Uh, and, and frankly, I think to a certain extent, historically, you look at a piece of fiber and there's two ends, right? And they don't, uh, to one of the earlier questions, Pond was the only place where they talk, uh, thought about a, uh, a optics in a broadcast mode. Uh, everything else is always a point to point mode. And so there's a little bit of that history, the momentum of the fact that we solve point to multi-point via electronic switches, right? Once you can do, uh, 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 the point, the multi-point in the optical layer, many, not all, but many of those switches go away, right? And, uh, and so there's a certain amount of industry momentum. Technology, it's, a, it's a, and I wouldn't call it a DSP anymore, I would call it a system on a chip, but it's that piece of silicon with a adequate enough intelligence to be able to manage uh, the optics. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Jeff. Uh, why don't we move over to Fahad from MKM. Uh, thank you for taking my question. Not sure if you can see me. Um, so my question to you guys is relative to your internal expectations, where do you see most of the upside coming from uh, 5G telco build outs or uh, web scale data center interconnect build outs? I have a couple of follow ups. It's a good it's a good question. You know, as, as we talked about, you know, with 74 percent of the market being from the CFP <coughs> and their adoption, the long cycle in the spend uh, is that 74 percent and 75 percent of that is with the top 50 of those service providers. So, I mean, following the economic principle, you know, certainly over the strategic period, we see that. Uh, but we also see the growth rate of that uh, of that ICP spend being uh pretty pretty significant. And so the beauty of what we see is those architectures are really coming together. Uh, you know, that data center, it's called Cord Herd in the, uh, you know, a, a central office reconfigured as a data center or a head end reconfigured as a data center. Those are really happening. And that's why these compact modular platforms, you're not just building for an ICP requirement, you're, you're really building for both. And that GX series that uh, Glenn went through is really built for both. So not trying to dodge your question. 
I'm saying, you know, we've developed a platform based on inputs from both uh, for the future. Certainly, uh, the long the long uh, play is is with the CSPs, but the ICPs remain a very very important segment for us, and that's why that five out of six, uh, you know, presence that we have today, we got to turn that into six out of six, and then go look for the next four to uh, ensure the top ten we're really uh, caring for because the growth in those data centers is just uh, enormous. Rob, did you have something to add there? Yeah, I was just going to say, uh, yeah, it, I mean, it's certainly true that the 5G market is going to be driving a significant amount of bandwidth in the edge of the network uh, and metro and aggregation, but that does also subsequently drive additional bandwidth growth in the core of the network as well. Um, while the total volume of bandwidth in the edge of the network is greater than it is in the core, we do see that uh, all the market trends point to the similar growth rate, about 35, 30, 35% growth rate in both metro capacity demands and long haul capacity demands. So um, I know Parthi likes to use a really good uh, analogy here of, uh, yes, as somebody like Amazon uh, distributes more of their uh, regional distribution centers and there's more of the little trucks delivering Amazon packages to the edge of the network. At the same time, there's an increase in demand in uh, the big Amazon trucks to carry traffic from data center to data center. Um, so again, we see the, and all the forecasts uh, point to bandwidth at the edge and core growing at about the same rate, just with the uh, edge starting with a, a higher base number. And to, to top off your, your question, cause you really asked when I, when I listened carefully to upside. So I think that's the base, the way we see the base growing just based on the economics of the numbers. But I think as Dave suggested, as you get to the edge of that network, there's a really profound problem going on that needs to be addressed where there's new market to gain, new TAM to create. So I guess if you're talking about upside, that's the way we look at it is that new TAM to create it is really driven by the immense activity at the edge of the network. And uh, by us going after that, we're creating not only new TAM, but we're also uh, keeping with the ZR plus uh, opportunity for us to further increase that vertical integration percentage across the platform uh, on top of what we're doing with the 800 gig. All right. And, and then maybe uh, the question on your long-term calendar 25 framework of mid-teens operating margin outlook. Um, if I understand, you know, silicon development is not getting cheaper. It's getting more expensive. You mentioned five nanometers. You won't shy away from investing in that. Uh, you've got XR optics, pluggables. You're going to have to invest in creating a new market opportunity for XR optics by yourself primarily because uh, you know, it's still something you're pioneering. I haven't heard many from the industry talk about it. So how do you make the math work to mid teens? Because you've got, I mean, $150 million just to develop on five nanometers, ASIC development costs, right? And this is significant investments coming along on the horizon and, and market investment costs on XR optics and creating that new incremental opportunity. So help me understand how you get to the mid teens if you can. Yeah, I think- hey, hey, Nancy, do you wanna take that first? And then Dave Welch, uh, maybe I'd like for you to add to that. Yeah, I'll start and then and go from there. Yeah, so um, certainly the growth that we're showing the eight to 12% growth um, and driving to a sustained level of profitability in the double digits um, with the ability to, to grow into the mid, mid teens. Um, that visibility that we're putting out there, um, you know, additionally didn't assume any additional operating leverage. So um, you're right in terms of the focus that's going to be needed in terms of our investment. Um, but we have been focused on that now, you know, as David mentioned, you know, 18, 24 months ago, we started putting in place uh, the framework and really focusing our R&D dollars on these key enabling technologies. Um, we have that in our plan, um, certainly going forward. Um, and that expansion and getting into that healthier business model um, with even um, higher operating margin certainly is upside from our target, um, but one that you know, we believe with um, the right market growth, the right gain and share, the right increase in vertical integration is, is achievable. Um, Dave can certainly comment on uh, us being the only one investing in this area because I think um, certainly we want to make sure that we we comment that that you know we have a lot of um, alignment on the customer and partner side there too. Right. Yes, yeah, so I'll, I'll add a couple commentary, and one is the um, uh, 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 XR 
will be uh, ultimately will be Infineer's uh, integration into the ecosystem uh, play that allows uh, the technology to be developed. One of the key architectural aspects of XR is the, uh, the um, communication language is fixed. I, there's, I don't need to develop a new FEC every time I make a DSP. I don't have to develop uh, the RTL. It's, a, it's the same. It has, it by definition, it is generationally compatible and therefore many of the things that I've had to uh, uh, redo the math and the RTL of the silicon in the past, I no longer, I don't have to do. I have to scale those chips and I have to put them in a higher order power uh, order node in order to drive the thermal dissipation power down so I can get more sophistication into it. So there is absolutely an investment in silicon. The, the DSP side investment uh, uh, is uh, not at the same level as we have on every one of our new chips. It, it creates an opportunity for doing a lot of client, client side management within there uh, in that. And so that, so the, uh, you know, getting the engine going, getting a, uh, a train of DSPs that go out and fill the 100 gig slot, the 800 gig slot, et cetera, uh, are important, but when if you look at the cost structure, what's it take to make a silicon chip? The actual fab piece is significant, but it's only about a third of the piece, right? It's the RTL uh, development, the tools necessary to do it. Well, a lot of that uh, carries over. It uh, has a high degree of IP reuse uh, between chips, you know, kind of by definition, by strategic intent. Okay. Uh Thanks, Fahad. We will move on to Mike Genovese. Mike. Great, thanks. Thanks very much. It's uh, Mike from uh, West Park Capital. Um, so there was a lot of talk about differentiation on XR. Um, uh, I guess I there was less about differentiation on ICE 6, and it was more like, uh, hey, there's two of us, so it's a great opportunity. <laughs> Um, so besides that customers, some of them want a second vendor, I, I wanted to ask um, if you could talk more about, I understand XR is part of the differentiation of the whole solution, but specifically for I6 differentiation, I, I wanted to ask about that. Hey, uh, Parthi, did you want to take that one first? Sure. Um, so, so, so Mike, there, there are two pieces. It's not a radical change. We, you know, it, 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 it's, a, it's a constant increment from I3 to I4 to I6. So in that sense, uh, we, we, you know, it's it's not a disruptive uh, uh, to the architecture. However, there are uh, significant uh, differences that we we do bring to the market. Uh, and the first thing, as I said, you know, if if uh, imitation is the best form of flattery, uh, subcarriers we develop this uh, to get the better reach uh, numbers. We see others coming on board uh, trying to pick it up. So we are on our second generation, uh, 800 gig. We are uh, driving 800 gig to a true deployment. So when people talk about 400 gig or ZR or 600 or 800, uh, those are nodes which then drop down effectively to, in the case of 600 gig technology to a 400 uh, and, and 800 typically doesn't run more than a couple of hundred kilometers. In our case, as, as done in all the trials and evaluations, uh, we truly drive uh, significant distances as published in our, in our trial papers, 800 gig or 800 kilometers uh, with deployment margins. So uh, in addition, uh, we also have very tight, you know, what we technically call roll off. That is our ability to uh, pack these wavelengths close together. That's our historical uh, super channel approach that we've been driving for a long time. And that increases the total capacity. So I would say the differentiation is that we can take the highest, higher capacity per wave. We can take that capacity over much larger distances and we can pack many of them so that you get uh, significantly higher capacities uh, per fiber. Uh, just to give you uh, a, a sort of a perspective uh, in, in, in a recent subsea evaluation, uh, we were, we've been able to pack together 
so much so that we can get over 20% capacity than our competition. So that is, I think, the big differentiation, how far they can take, how much capacity they can take, and how much capacity they can squeeze into a fiber. And that, that's the reason why, as you heard, Glenn, uh, you are seeing a large number of people uh, evaluating and going through the integration process for I6. I, I hope that gives you a feel. Yeah, that was helpful, thank you. Um, and then my second question, um, right now, because of the ongoing work from home, uh, stimulus and 5G, when I talk to access companies and the access part of the network, um, I'm hearing almost universally that the next five years should be the best five years ever uh, in the industry. Uh, but that's what the access companies are saying. So my question is, is, is that relevant for the Metro and the core? Could you have the best market ever for access? And, and, and you know, what does that do to the Metro and the core? And yeah, so, so I'm glad that, that they're seeing the best ever uh, access for five years. That means, uh, you know, you have to plug in those ports somewhere uh, on the Metro edge and, and all the way up. And that, you know, as bandwidth continues to grow, that's good for us. I think today we've tried to lay out our view um, of a very strong optical investment period from as we as we finish this challenge year with COVID and supply chain issues from 2022 to 2025. I think Nancy said it right. You know, we've been executing We've got to hit this next uh, target uh, business model in 2023. Beyond that, you know, look, it, it's a much better optical period to my first comment on that market. Yes, we feel good about the optical market. I wouldn't, uh, I, I like the fact they're saying that because that's uh, a positive indicator for us. Thanks, Mike. Uh, just a quick time check. Uh, you know, we still have quite a few questions in the queue, so we'll actually go a few minutes extra. So. Uh, We'll try to get to as many of them as we can. Uh, so with that, let's transition to Simon Leopold of Raymond James. Simon. Thanks, Amitabh. So I've got two questions. The first one is I, I, I appreciate the commentary on the Huawei, what we're recalling the backlash opportunity. I, I'd like a little help unpacking it in terms of quantifying the dollars available as well as the time frame. And, and where I'm coming from is I think the the amount of Huawei business annually ex China's two to two and a half billion. Uh, and I don't believe historically Infinair has had high exposure to India, which I think of as one of the earlier markets to be shifting away. We've also heard Europe's worth maybe almost a billion. But if you could maybe unpack a little bit more around how you take uh, your piece of that opportunity. And then I've got another question. Uh, hey, Glenn, do you want to take that first? And then maybe David Hurd, if you want to add to it. Sure, I can. I think that um, uh, I think that we share your view that that the Huawei spent or the the, the CapEx spent on Huawei is about uh, two billion, a little bit north of two billion dollars uh, ex China. Uh, it, uh, and and substantially, uh, you know, uh, that is 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 spent in in Europe. Uh, in Asia, as well as a smaller proportion in Latin America. I think that um, uh, we see two large spend areas, one uh, in particular in the long haul space in, in India that we see an opportunity for uh, Infinera to step into that market. Uh, in that we're on the cusp of, of an 800 gig deployment cycle uh, across India that we wanna be able to take advantage of. And then uh, in Europe, there's <clears throat> a large footprint uh, in Europe, and and uh, and as we have a relatively small share uh, in that footprint uh, right now, in particular in the metro networks, we see this as a large upside opportunity uh, for Infinera. And so I think that while we're coming off of a small base, uh, we see it as a, as a very good uh, upside opportunity, and we think we've got also a pretty good product portfolio uh, in the compact modular based GX product portfolio, which is easy to insert. Uh, into the Huawei footprint, and we've already had uh, uh, we've already had some early wins um, in terms of inserting our GX part, uh, product portfolio into the Huawei footprint in in Europe. And so we see this as the beginning of a very long cycle that we want to that we want to take advantage of. Um, we are seeing a lot of RFX activity right now uh, around uh, the Huawei footprint, uh, and so we see this as as, uh, as as a pretty good upside opportunity for us. 
Yeah, I would, I would probably add just a, a little bit of math here. So uh, it, to Glenn's point, the way we see that uh, two billion ish opportunity as you get out into 2025. It still takes a while for people to swap out networks, and Huawei has been hoarding a, a fair bit of supply. And so, in some jurisdictions, they're actually trying to use that to their advantage and, and are um, during the supply chain shortage. Uh, so, we kind of think about it internally. We look at that and say, yeah, by 2025, if there's a billion and a half opportunity uh, out there, we want to go get our fair share. Um, when we look at that opportunity, half of the opportunity is, um, think of it as long haul subsea metro core uh, opportunity. So half of it is going to ride that 800-ish uh, gig cycle. And then half of it, you, know, you got to look at metro uh, all the way down through metro access and aggregation to those 5G ports. And um, again, that is uh, a big focus of our portfolio. So we had two questions around this that I'm going to I'm going to entangle into one answer, which is everybody then says, so why didn't why didn't you build in 600 million into your model uh, or 500 million into your model in 2025 is it's hard to judge how, how fast these things are going to happen. We're winning deals now. We don't expect to see significant revenue until next year. So Nancy's built in. Uh, in amount, but not to that degree in terms of market share. The same question was some uh, industry analysts have uh, 800 gig pegged at three to 4 billion in, uh, in 2025. So why don't we build in, you know, 2 billion or a billion and a half into our numbers? Therefore, the CAGR would be some huge number. Uh, I would get right back to, we got to get our heads down and execute uh, what we said we've execute, take share, Eight to twelve percent is in growing ahead of the market and getting to a target business model in twenty three as our focus. If we built our business model on market analyst numbers, whether it was for four hundred Z ZR ZR plus any technology over the last twenty years, you should shoot us. Uh, it's just it's not that's not what we we're gonna do. Great. No, and, and I appreciate that. That's helpful. And, and my follow ups regarding the the XR. Um, I'll, I'll call it industry development. So I, I think the technological pitch is, is compelling. And clearly you have operators who agree, but the standardization process has changed dramatically in this industry. Mm -hmm. And historically operators don't buy into a monopoly. So if you're alone, it's really tough for, for an operator to embrace the technology. If there are other players, it gets easier. So I want a little bit of help understanding how you bring other players into the market. And in that scenario, are you licensing technology? Do you have some patents? Is there a moat? What makes this move to that next phase that operators can be comfortable to embrace XR? Thanks. Yeah, let me, let me hand this to Dave, but let me, let me start. So Dave mentioned this open XR forum, similar to what uh, ZR Plus has done. Uh, Dave mentioned we've met with 150 customers. They share. Look, we're going. Everything we do is open, and and as the we're not the market share leader here, so we have to take share and embrace open fully. Where that's part of our strategic logic, and so uh, you will see announcements on the XR forum, which is uh, very similar again to uh, how ZR Plus approach things. Uh, you know, today we have a number of players that have signed that uh, forum agreement. And so we'll be announcing that as we go out. These are household names that you would recognize. You know, we look at it very much like Pareto's rule, go after where that spend is, because that's who's going to change the architecture. We all know they take a while to change that architecture, which is why we're not building in huge amounts of revenue in the near term. It does take a while. Um, we are also embracing the supply chain there because you, you can't just have one supplier of the technology. So both from a DSP and, and T. Rosa and pluggable standpoint, uh, we will make the technology available uh, for the ecosystem. Um, our goal is, you know, to have a nice slice of a huge pie rather than, you know, it, the entire pie being, uh, you know, a cupcake, very, very small. Dave, do you want to add sure. anything there? Yeah, I'll just add on uh, 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 OpenXR Forum is a, a service provider uh, an end customer driven organization uh, of which uh, our uh, commitment 
to uh, those people that have signed up for that uh, is that we will provide uh, and make available technology at uh, uh, any number of horizontal uh, levels of integration uh, uh, that needs to happen in order for the uh, end customers to see the value of that MSA. Uh, the uh, end customers, uh, their job is to define the application, the specifications around a particular application and make sure that that fits in and the right sockets exist and the right management plane connectivity exists uh, to adopt XR. They define that specification. Uh, we sign up with MS agreements with other, uh, what, with other OEMs. We sign up MS agreements, MSA agreements with other uh, uh, component manufacturers. Uh, and uh, we'll sell at the horizontal that ranges anywhere from uh, uh, IP to DSP to modules to systems to software uh, uh, as appropriate uh, in there. Uh, there's no reason uh, uh, in over the long term, uh, point to multipoint is a far more capable technology that it doesn't take that the concepts don't take uh, the majority market share of uh, coherent optical transceivers over the years, right? And, uh, and we will uh, uh, I, I, um, ensure that the access to the technology is such that that can happen. Thank you. Thanks, Simon. Uh, we are kind of running a little behind, so let's move on to George, George Notter of Jefferies. Hey, thanks a lot, guys. I guess I just wanted to expand on that last question. Um, you're going down the MSA route with XR. Um, are there other historical precedents you can point us to for the creation of MSAs that um, you know went from sort of idea to revenue, you know, in a reasonable period of time? Uh, you know, I was looking at QSFP 28DD. You know, it's an MSA, of course. Obviously, it's not a direct comparable, but you know, that was originally created in March of 2016. And I think the final spec was done, you know, a year and a half later. And, and even today, you know, DD is still, you know, not really much in terms of revenue. So I guess I'm just curious if there's other MSA processes that you think would be a, a good analog for this. Sure. I mean, uh, you know, Open Rotom uh, is exactly the same scenario. Uh, I, uh, uh, ZR Plus, a uh, similar scenario, if you go to the radio world, uh, CDMA, uh, all these aspects, these are driven, uh, these uh, 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 impactful innovations are, comes, comes through uh, uh, from an originating member and ability to uh, uh, create multi-source agreements across the ecosystem. And then ultimately those MSA, the specifics of those MSA gets absorbed into standards bodies. I mean, that's the way the whole industry works. Uh, and so the, the impetus, uh, which is uh, the governing factor of time, is driven by the economic impetus. It is not driven by uh, the difficulty of creating the environment. When the, when the end customers come along and say, I need that uh, specification, well, then the ecosystem responds. Uh, and it's and it's and uh, for the end customer to say I need that, well, it's the economic benefit. It's that factor of four x reduction in the cost structure, in an area that they need to transform now. 22, 21, 22, 23. That infrastructure of edge uh, access and edge compute uh, is what they are trying to play, and this plays a substantive role in their definition of that. That's what drives the economic. I'm sorry, that's what drives the timing uh, of the technology. Uh, not uh, if, the, if the end customers want it, it'll happen right away. I think so to George's point though, the, the other piece that helps piggyback it is that the core on the point to point piece of XR is there on, uh, on a ZR plus equivalent. So as people go look to adopt uh, ZR plus in the 2022, 2023, 2024 timeframe, this does provide kind of that piggyback effect, kind of you're building around that same MSA. So uh, we've had a lot of other players that since some of the industry consolidation that's gone on between players that provide uh, scarce DSPs and, and packaging and systems players, um, 
they do want to have some other alternatives, um, you know, suppliers even on ZR Plus. And again, this technology is ZR Plus compliant in a point to point mode. Got it. I assume it's fair to say you think the MSA will be up and running by the end of 2023. I guess I'm assuming that because you're looking for significant revenue from XR in 2024. Is that? Yeah, I think what we're saying is first revenue in, in you know, kind of in 2023. Um, and, and yeah, you, you then start to really ramp as you get to 2024 and beyond. Thanks. Yeah, so if the question is if the MSA, uh, uh, we'll have MSA agreements you know, this year. Thanks, George. Thanks, Dave. Uh, let's move on to Christian Schwab of Craig Hallam. Christian? Uh, I thought I saw Jim Suva up there somewhere. He might have disappeared. Uh, no, we see them all. Uh, oh, there he so, is. Okay, why don't we move on to Dave Kang and then we can circle back to you, Christian. Uh, Dave, if you want to unmute and turn on your video. Go ahead, Dave. All right, Jim's ready. He's got Jim's his video ready. on. And his Come on. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, let's go to Jim then. Jim Suva. <laughs> Great. Th thank you so much. And I want to give my compliments to Amitabh and his team and putting this all together for so smooth of an operation. So thank you. I just have one question. And that is um, on your guidance and outlook, which was very detailed and, and, and good. Any comments on cash flow, or maybe I missed part of that. In, any thoughts about cash flow generation, targets of use, maybe a percent or mirroring or monitor net income, or given the supply constraints that we've seen, do you need to you know, spend a little bit more on working capital, such as inventory buffers? Thank you so much. Uh, no, good question, Jim. Um, so I guess I'll break this kind of near term, longer term, certainly in the shorter term. Um, and we commented this on, on our earnings call. We, we will likely be utilizing cash in the nearer term as we're making sure that we're shoring up that inventory um, given the industry-wide semiconductor shortages. But as we look longer term, the business model, particularly as we get to the target range um, and have that at a sustained level, does put off good cash. Um, it generates... Um, you know, certainly positive cash flow and meaningful cash flow. Um, so, you know, right now we're sitting in a position where we have access to, to um, the markets with our ABL. Um, we paid that down uh, last quarter. We've got ample access to draw on that if we need to. Um, and going forward, we expect and want to be in a position where we're generating our own cash and um, the model gets us there. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Uh, I'll just cycle through uh, some of the others. Uh, Samik Chatterjee from JP Morgan. I don't know if you're able yep. to. Okay, go Hi. ahead. Um, if you can hear me, yeah, thanks. Uh, so just a quick clarification first. Um, so you talked about the use cases for XR optics extending from multi-point to point to kind of the point-to-point -point use cases as well. I'm just wondering how would that price point compare to a more of a point-to-point solution like a pluggable ZR or ZR plus, because we've often seen it in networking equipment where you have a feature rich product, which is higher ASP or higher cost than kind of more of a targeted product for that part of the market. So just help me think about that. Uh, and then I have a follow up, please. And so it, so I'll, I'll talk on, on uh, two things, uh, you know, price is driven by uh, uh, two, two um, um, uh, issues. It's driven by what your cost structure is and it's driven by what your market value is. Uh, from a cost structure point of view, uh, it has everything that is the same as a other co as any other 400 gig coherent plug. It's got a laser, a modulator, a DSP, etc. Uh, the DSP you pay on a dollar per square inch of silicon uh, for that, at least you, the uh, when you buy it from TSM City. Uh, and so the cost structures are, you know, there's no difference uh, except in volume. The fact that XR uh, pushes deeper into the edge inherently you understand, you know, if I go from a place that aggregates 400 gigabit to a place that aggregates 100 gigabit, well, I'm guaranteed at least 4x more volume. If I go to the aggregation at 25 gigabits, well, I'm guaranteed, uh, you know, uh, you know, 16x 
uh, more volume. And it's frankly, it's more like 100x more volume. Uh, I, uh, just because I can push those technologies to the edge, those volumes will enable XR to be a lower cost structure uh, platform for the industry. You throw on top of that, the fact that we use photonic integration, we have one monolithic piece of optics, we have one monolithic piece of silicon inside that, uh, uh, inside our optical module. Those things are very akin to high volume manufacturing as opposed to others that build it with multiple optical elements, multiple packages, multiple thermoelectric coolers, et cetera. They aren't very akin to high, high volume manufacturing. Net net, uh, our implementation of XR, even though it's more sophisticated, uh, has the capability to have the best cost structure in the industry. And then you go in and you say, well, NETS also happens to be the most capable uh, technology. And there you've got an opportunity to uh, drive value pricing as opposed to cost structure pricing. Uh, and that, you know, I'm going to reduce their network cost by a factor of four. Well, you know, there's value in that. Uh, and there's an opportunity. Uh, and then you throw in the third element, that piece of silicon has as much intelligence in it as your transport box. I can put a lot of software and a lot of applications in inside that little tiny pluggable. Uh, and uh, so you've got a whole, uh, whole paradigm change in how that optical industry has worked in the past. Uh, and uh, so hopefully that gives you some insight there. Yep. Uh, just as a follow-up, I know you talked about um, kind of the upcoming investment cycle where all service providers now need to invest, particularly in the metro. Uh, but if you go back and look at the history of the kind of optical industry, there have been clear distinct periods of investment in long haul followed by investments in metro. So just wanted to get your thoughts of how long this investment cycle in the metro lasts and how should we think about when you have an 8 to 12% kind of target at this point, how should we break that down into more of a sick, what portion of that is more driven by cyclically higher investments happening right now over the next few years? Yeah, I, I would Go say ahead. the reason we're giving you the 22 to 25 interval, and, and that's, a, that's a lot of years in our industry to look ahead. So uh, we think that this eight by four by one plays out where 800 gig is still going to uh, scale in that period and be growing uh, in the core, in the long haul, and, uh, and in subsea. 400 gig is going to definitely be, uh, as we said, uh, ZR, ZR plus, when you look at the numbers this year, it's very little. Uh, so it starts to scale uh, next year and into 2023, 2024, 2025. So we think that metro cycle then lays just on top of that uh, and continues uh, beyond uh, 2025. And uh, to Dave's point, uh, as people shift the architecture and have the need as they think about 5G and God help us, 6G and uh, mobile edge compute, um, by introducing uh, an optic that can, that can participate in that ZR plus in the meat of the market, and then uh, be able to uh, bring dynamic policy to the edge of the network um, as you get into, again, revenue wise into that 23, 24, 25 and beyond. We think that's a pretty long cycle. And, and yeah, some of it is, it, it's all driven from the architectural need in the network to, uh, to be able to adapt to the changing traffic pattern, which is A, unpredictable and B, you know, continuing to grow and C, where you're setting up data centers everywhere. And in a hybrid cloud environment, you're constantly moving uh, data around. It's kind of Medcap's law to a new power, right? Not N squared, right? You're, you're adding another digit. Yeah, so I'll, I'll uh, add, uh, you know, three quick points on top of that. Uh, uh, Metro inherently has more geographic locations, inherently takes, takes longer to roll out, right? Uh, the uh, the a movement of data center functionality to the edge will require construction, right? It's gonna happen, it has real value, it's got lots of location. You know, uh, the number of, uh, I'm not sure I know the number today, but uh, the number of Google sized data centers in North America, yeah, there are a few, you know, a few handfuls, right? The number of CEO offices in America, tens of thousands, right? 
the number of cell towers in America, hundreds of thousands, right? Uh, in, uh, in that. Uh, so the, the extent of opportunity is deep, but because there's so many geographic locations, they can't do it in a day. They won't do it in a day, right? Uh, but uh, but you, can, you can see the, the battle developing uh, the uh, service, oppor service opportunity of edge compute uh, and the enabling technologies that enhance the ability for edge compute to happen are big deals. They are the next wave uh, of, of, uh, of the network uh, and the access to that, of which 5G plays a huge role in and uh, ultimately high capacity, any high capacity uh, interconnection is gonna play a huge role in how that, how that goes forward. Thanks, Thank you. thanks, Amit, thanks, Dave. Uh, we're just gonna take two final questions. We're well over time. Uh, and as a reminder, please, if you could fill out the survey, that would be great. So let's go to Tim Savage of Northland Securities. Tim? How about that? Can you hear there me? There Yep, we hear you. Okay, great. Um, I think my XR optics question was answered subsequently in context. So I want to focus on 800 gig, where you did mention industry leading reach performance. And for an 800 gig wavelength, I just want to find out where that stands right now, specifically what kind of reach you're seeing, or should we assume that longer reach applications are going to run at you know, 400 or 600 or something less? On the one hand, that's one question. And then, you know, part two is to the ex extent at, you know, lower reaches, there really is no spectral efficiency advantage between 800 gig and 600 gig. Are we not perhaps missing a horse from this race that we've been talking about? Uh, part three, why don't you take uh, actually both parts and then uh, David Hurd or sure. anybody else you want to add? Okay. Um, so, so two, uh, you know, two parts to it. What's the 800 gig uh, reach, uh, and then uh, what about 800 versus 600 versus 400 in spectral efficiency? Uh, in in terms of reach, uh, we we truly believe our 800 gig offering, and it's not just us. You you you've seen uh, the testimonials and the long lineup. Uh, truly, customers are looking at our 800 gig as a long haul solution. Uh, we are quite comfortable. Uh, because this is based on, on actual field trials, uh, talking about in excess of 800 gig. We have an OFC paper where we'll talk about uh, much larger uh, distances that we can drive. Uh, and as we increase the baud rate to 100 gigabaud, that actually translates to extended reach. Now, one of the factors, and this will dovetail into the second part of the question, uh, is, uh, as you point out, it's not 800 gig. Uh, our 800 gig solution uh, is deployed at, at 800 gig in some instances of the network, but goes down to 350, 400 uh, gigabits per second when it goes to subsea. Uh, and with probabilistic shaping, we actually have a fine grain of 50 gig. So it's not a question of whether there is 400 or 800. It's a total question of how much capacity. Now, the second piece to bear in mind as we drive, uh, in fact, as you go to subsea or ultra long haul, uh, you really want to run at lower baud rates. Uh, that's where the other piece of information that I talked about, which is our roll-off factors and our ability to push the channels together. We've been pushing uh, super channel concepts for quite a long time. And therefore we are able to squeeze those channels closer together uh, with you know everybody's line systems today is very flexible. So we can really squeeze those channels and get a much higher capacity. Uh, so I would say the, the reach uh, based on uh, deployment and end of life criteria, not just a hero experiment uh, is, is quite impressive to our customers. And we see uh, the 800 gig being deployed not just in 800 gig applications, but all the way down to 300, 350 uh, gigabits per second. Hey, Parthi, I think Tim was looking for a number though too. So at 800 gig, what do you see today and what do you see tomorrow? So today we, we are quite comfortable at uh, 800 kilometers uh, where we get to uh, 100 uh, gigabytes or one. Uh, I, I will just leave it as 
in excess of uh, 800 kilometers. Now realize it's all fiber plant. Uh, yeah. One one last point, David, uh, is that uh, we do already deploy uh, 600 gig technology solutions. It's not new to us, so it's not a competition. We are actively deploying CHM2T that goes at 400 gig and 600 gig, yeah. and in those same applications, we will be able to increase the total capacity for our customers. And to Tim's other point, right, whether it's 600 gig, 400 gig solutions, right, it, the, that's why the long cycle is so important to understand. It doesn't mean there's just two people now that everybody's going to adopt uh, fifth generation DSP technology it, it overnight. It, so we, we absolutely recognize that. And that's why, you know, you're not seeing us build some ludicrous market share number into our uh, into our financials. So. Uh, still a lot of execution ahead, a lot of market to cover. Thanks, Tim. Uh, why don't we take the last question from John Lopez of uh, Vertical Group. John. Hi, thanks very much. Did I, uh, did I get through? Yep, we hear you. Oh, great. Oh, good. I, I just have one. Sorry, I'll keep it quick. I know everybody wants to get out of here. But um, I, I guess it's probably for Nancy, but anybody care to chime in. If we take the the sort of top line framework that you guys have laid out for the next few years. And then we kind of graph over some of the commentary on, on 800 gig. It, it would seem like out to 2023, you don't get any growth other than 800 gig. Um, that sort of seems conceptually wrong to me, given your focus on 100 and 400. Could, could you maybe just talk through that a bit? Do you feel as though you have growth drivers across that whole stack? And is there anything kind of weighing between now and then that we should that we should think about? Yeah, no, it's a really, really good question. So when you think about that eight by four by one, that those are really the biggest growth drivers, right? So the core 800 gig growth, the Metro growth in, in 400 gig, and then albeit uh, some creation of some new opportunity as well as vertical integration improvement um, on the uh, XR, ZR plus, uh, you know, vertical integration. Don't forget, while that's going, when you look at the legacy network, uh, people are going to be phasing out of uh, older legacy technology. And so over the last three years, we've, you know, it's, this happens in every networking company, right? You lifecycle manage. So you're, you're phasing out some of the older generation technologies and platforms that, that goes down. And, and so your overall growth rate of eight to 12%, you're actually growing much faster uh, in the uh, in in that eight by four by one, kind of like that one chart shows you the overall optical market. That's why it looks like two to three percent when in the in the core of that eight by four by one. Boy, that open optical segment is growing at double digit, going up. And so we mine that very carefully, like most infrastructure uh, companies, and we bake that into our uh, our future business model. Nancy, anything to add there? Uh, just, you know, to reiterate what you had mentioned earlier and that um, certainly the team, right, is off to capture every bit of the analyst expectations in terms of market growth. But I'm building this from a bottoms up perspective, right? And, you know, we want to show you that there's upside from here, but, you know, we are really focused on getting to that target model and uh, exploiting the market everywhere we can. Yeah. Really helpful. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks, John. Uh, you know, with that, I think we'll bring the event to a close. Uh, you know, as you all know, we really enjoy the Q&A portion of these presentations. It's our opportunity to engage with you. It's probably the most energetic and exciting for us. So before we wrap up, I'd like to turn the floor back to David Heard. David, if you want to make just uh, any closing comments. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. So one, uh, thank you all for your patience. We know staring in a screen uh, for the last, uh, four, you know, 14, 16 months. Uh, has not been a, a lot of fun. Uh, we did our best to try to give you a view. These are always better live, but we tried to give you a view, not of our quarterly view of getting through this year. Uh, we've done that on prior uh, earnings calls. And, and again, we're not changing what we've said in our prior earnings call with respect to 2021. This was really to give you that 2022 to 2025 uh, you know, strategic view and view of the opportunity for Infinera. So, A, really appreciate your patience. Hopefully, we were able to take some of the market and technology uh, jargon and translate that into, uh, you know, the compelling investment thesis for Infinera. That was our job. Uh, it, being uh, techies at heart for, for many of us, it's hard to do. 
So you've seen us try uh, over the last couple of quarters to give you tidbits of market updates and technology updates uh, to help along that way. We'll continue to do that. And your feedback is really, really important to make sure we're translating and giving you, again, not only the short-term views and our quarterly earnings calls, but how we're progressing along these long-term milestones. It's certainly what we're holding ourselves uh, accountable for. So again, we appreciate the patience. We look forward to your feedback, as Amnitab has said, uh, in the survey to get better. We haven't done one of these in a long time. So we hope uh, we hit your mark in terms of giving you that fill in for that 22 to 25 longer term view of the company. With that, uh, please take care of yourselves uh, and your families. We'll continue uh, to take care of uh, our families, our, our employees, our customers, and thus our shareholders. So thank you all and please stay well. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.